um, thank you all for coming, making the journey down. As, as people said, stolen a lot of my lines. Um, it's good to see you all. My name is Shirley Rouse. I'm head of stakeholder engagement. I'm sure a lot of you have seen me from the neck up at least. Um, either as your OAM or chairing the REC, REC meetings. Um, and today really was born out of the RIGs. Um, so the RIG is the REC issues group. It's a monthly forum where, which allows REC parties to raise issues um, and just oh, fr talk freely, I guess, about um, questions and concerns they have related to the REC. Um, obviously, the REC went live during a time where we couldn't meet in person and we've kind of been stuck like that for um, some time. Um, and increasingly, we were getting requests for not a return to the old ways, but a bit more of a hybrid approach. So today really is, is putting our toes in the water to see how that works. So the engagement day um, is going to be a little bit like the rig, where we've got the panel session this afternoon, which will allow you to ask questions and get hopefully immediate answers, um, but also to hear about what the wider code manager teams have, have got going on. So please engage, please put your hand up, please ask the questions or not hand up, is it? No, slow <laughs> dose. Um, but um, today will be all the better, the more you're willing to, to talk. Um, and engage with what's going on. So in terms of agenda, as you can see before the break, we've got four presentations from across the code manager teams, one on the REC portal. We've had a lot of improvements happening in the past few months, so we'll be talking through those. Um, and I think Paul, there's the ability later on for people to come and see you and yeah. demonstrations and things towards the end of the day. Um, Paul and Doris is going to talk through some of the um, work that's going on the change team. Got Mark Loveday here from RECO, who's going to be talking to you about theft. Um, yeah. And then some updates on the performance assurance activities from Anton. See a break. And then some um, presentations related to MHHS. And then after lunch, we have the panel session, and that's where we kind of need your help. So there will be a panel made up of um, code manager teams and RECO. Um, so please, throughout the day, put your questions into Slido and they can be addressed at, at that point. And then as Paul mentioned, um, the opportunity to meet your OAMs and the performance assurance team and I think the other code manager teams, there's going to be rooms um, dedicated to each of us. So wander around and it's like parents evening, wander around <laughs> and, and, and feel, uh, feel free to speak with us. And then, so we'll plow on through until that time. But uh, yeah, thank you all. Um, any questions? Let me know. If not, I think we'll back on. Uh, yeah. Um... This hasn't displayed properly because uh, because I'm presenting instead of what who should have been. Um, but if you are, if you didn't use the QR code, you can go to slido.com and put in that code that's on the screen now. So 22767666, or you can use the QR code, which will appear on every slide if you do want to enter um, that, that way um, to get to the, the points. We might have a problem. We have to sort it out of the break because it's yeah. not. It's also the the chat. There's, also a link in the chat well. there's a link in the chat for those on the live stream. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And I welcome Ros up to join me now um, for the first part of the agenda, which is going to be talking about the project um, to uplift the user experience on the REC portal. And Ros is here from a uh, uh, technical services um, side to speak around the changes made to the digital REC and data specification, market messages elements as well over the course of the same period. Uh, wonderful. I've introduced myself, uh, but Ros, do you want to just uh, briefly explain your role within the code manager? Hello everyone, I'm Rosalind Templey from the REC Technical Design Authority team and we look after the more technical elements of the REC, including hosting the data specification and digital REC. Absolutely. Uh, and as I said, Paul Rock, Head of Communications, uh, yes, responsible for events and, and the bulletins that we send out, but also responsible on a more general level for the REC portal service. So I want to talk briefly around a project um, that we've been working on since way back in November 2023 was when it kicked off and it actually just concluded um, within the last week. And the project was essentially around user experience, user interface across the REC portal and what was known, and I'm not going to refer to this again, um, but as the digital navigator in the old world. We don't refer to that anymore now. We've got a more congruent single service system coming out of this project. Um, so the, the use to be called a digital navigator now it's just the the rec portal environment with elements um, from the technical services there as well before i go into uh the outputs of the project and, and a bit of a demonstration on what we've got now in within the portal just a little bit on um what what is good ux ui what is a good user experience um 
And when we kicked off uh, this project, we did so because we'd received some feedback that there was a need for a change. A good user experience should mean that a, the digital service users find it easy to interact with at all, uh, that they can carry out all the tasks they need to complete quite in a quite straightforward manner. They can get to the key information that they need to get to quickly, and it's intuitive to use, even for a first time user. Someone can come onto the system and know exactly how to use the system. Um, and you told us through uh, the RECO customer satisfaction surveys, through feedback, through your OAMs, uh, through meetings and interviews that we set up as part of this project, that the portal fell down in several of those areas. It, it wasn't uh, the most logical to use sometimes. It was particularly difficult to navigate and to search and find the information you needed. So with RECO, we agreed that a specific project should be defined to gather user information together um, and also seek professional advice. And we, we had from across the code manager, um, user experience experts coming in to give their professional advice on what elements of the portal um, met best practice standards and, and where best practice could be brought in to, to uplift the, the service even better. So we set up the project uh, with an established project team and we prioritised the areas of change um, that we thought we needed to bring forward, uh, focusing on high value quick wins. So we wanted to target low hanging fruit, look at where the portal was really causing um, uh, user discomfort and, and where we could make the highest value using the smallest amount of effort to get those four, those changes in as quickly as possible. Um, and we developed a, uh, a unified, something called a unified design approach. So we looked at all the different um, types of layouts and buttons and screens that we would use across the whole service and looked to standardise as much as we could to make sure that the experience that you have when you go onto any element of the portal is a similar one and also increasing congruence in the look and feel and design between the portal and the elements of what was the digital navigator to make it feel like when you're in the rec portal environment, you're in a rec environment. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to you whether you're looking at the, the market messages or whether you're looking at the PDF versions of the rec schedules, the, the, the experience that you have on the portal should, should be familiar to you and it should be intuitive and, and you should know what, what, what you're looking at. So our objectives were to modernise to standardise and to optimise the user experience, user interface across the portal, really bring it up to date, really look at what best practice was in other codes, but also outside of the industry um, and bring those forward into, into the portal. And we've started to implement uh, some key changes um, in a number of blocks um, since uh, September this year. So we had a, a long period of user engagement um, and then a period of prioritization and, and development. But we got to a point finally in September where we were ready to bring forward a big suite of changes into the live environment. And these are some of the areas that I'll demonstrate in a minute through, through the portal of how we've made some, some changes. Um, basically, very quickly. Um, we, we've introduced a big, big new mega menu. We've completely reskinned the home page. We've got new ways to, to present rec documents. Um, we've worked on data spec and digital rec, which we've watched them talk on in more detail. We have a new way to consume rec, latest rec news. The change management area has been completely uplifted. Performance assurance has got a lot, uh, a brand new menu and a, a lot more information as, assigned to it. Committees is completely reworked as well, and every page within the rep portal has been looked at um, and brought up to the new standards. So basically, wherever you're on the rep portal now, you're seeing uh, an uplifted um, experience. Um, also worth noting, though, that portal development doesn't stand still. So even though the project has come to its end, doesn't mean we're we're saying that the portal is a finished project that meets all of your um, goals. We know it doesn't. We know that we have a backlog of, of changes and issues that we want to work through, and we want your help to continue to prioritise what are those causing you the most pain. Uh, so please let us know if you're struggling and finding it difficult to use elements of the portal uh, still. But these are some of the things that we're focusing on still at the moment, some of those top items, major items within our backlog. Um, at the moment, we're looking at the ways that um, your ongoing annual maintenance and qualification is managed on the portal, working very closely with the performance assurance teams to look at the workflow for how you upload documents, fill in questionnaires and have a to and from with the code manager during that <laughs> period. 
we're looking at the the search. Um, we realise still that it sometimes when you're searching for, for example, a schedule, you'd you'd expect it to be the number one result, schedule one, or schedule one's going to appear at the top. It doesn't quite as that. We're limited by some of the platform, but we know it's something we need to look at. So it's something we're we're focusing on. We have some new dashboards going into performance assurance that I'll show you in a second, but we're working with the performance assurance teams to look at whether um, individuals can be given uh, <coughs> certain access to specific dashboards and not others. So um, sort of ring fencing the dashboards that they can see um, rather than giving them a blanket access to all of those dashboards. Looking at the ways that you upload your um, documents to the performance assurance through your organization sites as well, and um, there is some um, logic that isn't quite right about when a uh, when a uh, an RFI response, for example, is is deemed to be pending or approved, and some of the notifications that get spat out aren't quite logical. So we're looking to work on that. We're looking to bring a brand new events calendar into the portal, which will look at all the events being hosted by Reco and the code manager and the committee meetings, and present them in a in a, in a logical way for you. We're looking at how notifications work. We know that some of the notifications that are generated to your emails, for example, particularly when you have documents uploaded into your performance assurance organization mm -hmm. files, they're a bit useless. They don't really tell you much. They Some of the error messaging is, is not quite right as well. So we're looking at a root and branch review of how notifications are generated by the portal. Um, and finally, the, the last one is really just on some of the uh, nomenclature um, used on the on the portal to describe rec documents. So if you didn't know, for example, that a certain operational document was a category three document, you might not know to go to the category three documents to find it. And because the search doesn't quite work perfectly as it should as well, it can make it a bit difficult to know where you're getting to. So we're trying to follow the flow of trying to make it easier for, for people to know where they need to go to what part of the portal to find what Sorry, that's a, a, a whiz through some of the things, but just to give you a perspective, really, that we are not standing still. We have a backlog. Just because the project's coming to an end, it doesn't mean the work on the portal is going to stop. Far from it. OK, now I'm going to move forward to a demonstration. Um, I'm going to flick over to the portal. Hopefully everyone can see that. So I mentioned a few things. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll, Ross will just talk talking in a second, but uh, a couple of things before we I do hand over to Ross. Um, for those of you who haven't been on the portal recently, this might look a bit different to you. Uh, but if you've been on the last month, you, you'd have seen this um, th this new uh, display. And the first thing to notice along the top there is our new mega menu. Um, so from anywhere in the portal within two clicks, the design is that you can get to um, the key areas in the portal that you need to frequently navigate to. Um, so if you want to get into the code products section and see the rec and rec schedules, it's nice and easy for you to navigate through that mega menu, which will appear in the same form wherever you are within the portal. Um, five top level items, code products, change and release, organization management, the knowledge center, which includes a lot of your hubs and wiki and service desk and things like that, and rec committees as well. Now, even today we had a release last night into the portal we're adapting the ux design again even though the project's finished we're not standing still as i say we received some feedback immediately following the release that parties found the uh, responsiveness of the mega menu a little bit tricky um sometimes when you hovered well the, the design was when you hovered over it, it would appear when you hop when you took your cursor off it it would disappear but then it would come back a bit too soon and we've reverted to a solution now where you click to show on the mega menu and you click to hide on the mega menus to 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 remove some of the frustration that some parties were experiencing uh, a completely reworked home page as i mentioned before um, where you've got information um, sort of related. We, we looked at analytics and we saw that um, people were really going onto the portal to actually access the products themselves. Um, so we've highlighted them up, up top and up front uh, to make it easy for parties to get to. We've brought some key change information to the forefront of the homepage as well, so that the latest and upcoming releases can be easily accessed um, through their individual release pages. And you have a list of recently updated change proposals. And at the bottom as well, some key rec information, key services and key links to portal hubs as well. As long as the old um, elements like the Let's Chat module, which allows you easy access to the service desk. And you can always get back to the homepage from wherever you are on the portal by clicking on the rec logo in the top left hand corner, which will take you to the top. 
in the rec documents section. So a couple of ways to get there. Um, you can get there either through these links on the right hand side of the page or through code products and into the rec and rec schedules, for example. This will bring up a list of all the schedules in numerical order that exists within the portal. And we have some um, new functionality which enables you to look at these documents in a slightly different way. So against all of these, you can choose to download the file locally to your device. You can choose to preview the document in a uh, new tab, so it'll open like that. Uh, you can choose to copy a link to your clipboard. You'll get a success message in the bottom left-hand corner there, so you can share it with a colleague. Or, and this is probably where I'll uh, hand over to Ros now, you can choose to click to go to the digital version. You'll be asked to sign in. And this will take you off to the digital version of the uh, code. And Ros, do you want to just explain what that's all about? <laughs> so, so essentially, whichever version of the code you're looking at, whether it's the Word, the PDF, or the digital version, it's all drawn from a central system digitized system. Our UX project has redesigned the look and feel, so you've now got that congruent look between what was Digital Navigator and Rec Portal, so we're retiring that name because no matter where you look now, it's all the, the same um, appearance, which makes it slightly difficult to have that nuance. We've got one of the feedback points we previously had was around speed of loading for the digital rec. So a lot of effort has gone into improving that speed of load. So now when you're clicking on around this digitalized version of the code, mm -hmm. it's much quicker. Heading back up to, apologies, slowly navigating on a different computer. Heading back to the main mega menu, get onto code project. You'll now see that all of those previous um, digital navigator items are part of that bigger mega menu. For example, if you want to look at market messages, they're now in the menu here. And the biggest change we've made around market messages based on feedback is we've brought up the message structure. So previously, you had to click on multiple scenario variants and open lots of pages to see all those different structures. Now they're all on the same page, and there's a nice little toggle button. Like to see. And the only other thing I was going to point out was a new location for Erin up at the top here. So Erin is our digital, uh, sorry, our natural language processing tool on the REC. So it's like mm -hmm. ChatGPT, but specifically trained on the Retail Energy Code. Um, so if you want to ask any questions, Erin can help you navigate the REC. Hand back to Paul. Oh, thank you, uh, Just a couple of last things to demo. Um, you notice on the front page of the portal here, we've got the new latest rec news uh, section. Um, we had the old carousel on the old portal homepage before, but it was quite difficult. Uh, you couldn't see any um, sort of old news articles. You now have the ability to view all the news articles that have been created um, since the portal has, has gone live here. Um, and you can also choose uh, once you log in. You can also choose to subscribe. Um, to receive um, emails when a new news article is posted as well. So if you didn't want to wait till your weekly bulletin summary of all the news under the red, you could choose to subscribe and receive an email every time we post a new news article, which we do most days, uh, things like rec party register uploads. Um, the ability We've got the ability now within these news articles to create a sort of multimedia um, elements to it as well. So we can embed um, videos. This is a, just a demonstration of what I'm doing today, a uh, demonstration of some of the changes that we've um, brought into the portal recently. So. That's your ability to, to, to access news that way. Change management's had some major changes, uh, which I'll just focus on quickly. The, the old menu design has, has completely changed. You've now got a lot more information about what you're navigating into uh, when, you're, when you're using the change management pages. The change register itself has had a complete redesign and reskin. Um, we'll load in a, in a, in a, in a, just a moment. We had to change the... Um, uh, uh, the the format the way the change register is populating at the moment um just to make sure it's uh getting all the correct data but as you can see now it's a much more, uh, easier design uh, which can be uh, searched filtered um sorted by uh, any column that appears on the uh on, on the register as well and then when you click into any uh individual change or issue that appears on the register Let's pick uh, an old one so you can see something that's had a lot of updates. Click on R003. We have some um, uh, a different layout on the information that you can see within one of these pages as well, where the information is much more um, 
easily digestible in a single place. You can see all the activity that a change has been through easily on the left hand side. Access um, documents related to the change, for example. Um, and this uh, is the case for every change. You can also see the original submission in a way that you can now copy and paste from, which you couldn't do before. You can, it's an easy grid of uh, impacted parties and the milestones that a change has been through as well. Um, I'm a little bit over time, but I'm going to be quick. Performance assurance dashboards, we've uh, changed. I'm not associated with any uh, any organisation on this profile, but if you are associated with an organisation, you're going to see all your organisations listed here, have the ability to select through them and have an easy menu and way to navigate um, through your performance assurance sites. And if we move over to committees briefly as well, a new way to access news related specifically to committees when agendas or minutes get published and easy ways in to see individual uh, committee workspace as well. Like the metering expert panel here, if I click through to that, you're going to be taken now immediately to the document library for a metering expert panel where you can access documents rather than having to go two more clicks through a through a page. And then, as I mentioned before, general uplifts across all the pages. So every page has been, I'll take a page at random, every page has been um, updated to um, apply the new design, the new colour schemes, boxes, links, logos, everything like that has, has been changed across the portal to uplift to the new design. That's the demo. Reiterate that we're not standing still, further work remains ongoing. We're updating all the user guides to, to reflect the new designs as well. And they're uploaded through the Knowledge Centre on the, on the portal. Ros and I are going to be in a room after lunch, so if you have any specific questions about how you use the portal, we're more than happy to talk you through um, the different elements um, of that as well. Um, and that's me for, for the time being. I don't know if any questions have, I'm probably a little over, but I don't know if any questions have been raised on Slido yet. So you can save your questions up for the panel session or for the demo that Ros and I can provide in a breakout room after lunch as well. Up to you how you, you would want to do that. And a reminder as well that you don't just have today to ask us your questions. OEMs are always happy to help you navigating the portal. The service desk is always happy to help and the let's chat function is a really quick way to get easy answers to and quick answers to any questions you've got using the portal as well. And, and feedback's always welcome. So yes, do keep telling us. Thank you very much. That's all from me. Uh, and now, thank you very much, Ross. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, now we go uh, Welcome Paul Whitson Doris to the stage. Paul is the uh, head of uh, what's your job title? Head of change management at the Code Man. Um, and he's yeah. going to yeah. talk us through some changes that have, that have happened recently within the change management process. And, uh, yeah, after you, sir. Thanks, Paul. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, yeah, as Paul has said, I'm the relatively new uh, head of change management for uh, REC. Um, Basically, what I want to do today is talk you through a recent change improvements projects to try and improve the process within the change team. Some of the benefits that have come out of that and also sort of introduce you virtually to the change team uh, on this slide. So um, again, like Paul said, any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is the team. Uh, we've had a few changes recently, a few internal changes where people have sort of um, moved to other teams. So we've got a few new faces here. Uh, we've got Sam, who's the change manager. Uh, she's off sick at the moment. So Holly is covering for Sam as the change and the release manager and doing a great job. Uh, we've got Harriet, who's in the room, I think, or not. No, she's not she will be. The, she will be in the room. Um, so she's uh, our senior change analyst and uh, our MHHS expert. So um, she's uh, a key member of the team. And then we've got uh, Flo, who's joined us recently, Luke, who's joining us on Monday, uh, Lydia, Caroline and James, who are uh, established change analysts. So um, hopefully this team will remain quite stable now, um, but we've got a really good team of people here who are there to help you. And I think you may have met some of them probably online uh, virtually with any of the changes that have uh, taken place recently. I guess just to explain, um, in case you don't know, but yeah, anyone can raise a, a change, whether they're an interested person, a stakeholder, um, and you can either raise an issue or a change via the REC portal or through your OEM or through the REC service desk. So again, um, I guess as a digital code, we're trying to encourage people to go onto the portal, or understand anything about change on the portal, but also to raise um, issues or changes there. We've also got the REC issues group. And we've got the change issues group. So all sorts of, uh, I suppose, opportunities and avenues to raise a change. Um, over and above, I guess, what the team do is the core 
role. Uh, they also obviously manage the rec portal from a change perspective, and we've had quite a lot of good feedback about the changes that have happened recently in terms of the improvements with the UX UI. Um, they provide the weekly change bulletins. They put content in the change bulletins. Um, they host webinars. They provide podcast inputs. Um, and they basically just sort of make sure that the, the, the change process is running. If you haven't seen the latest podcast, I think Holly's done a 16 minute podcast on the latest release that's coming um, on Friday, where I think there are 13 releases uh, this month. So a lot of hard work's been going into uh, basically making things uh, better. And again, since go live, we've had just over 220 changes and issues. Uh, which I think is a pretty pretty big achievement. So uh, yeah, constantly looking to improve the processes and make things better. Okay. Um, again, it's probably a few months old now in terms of when the change improvements uh, went live. But I guess for some of you, I've I've been in role probably for three months, so it went live probably just as I started. But I know that a lot of hard work took place uh, before I joined. Um, I think there was a lot of feedback from industry. Um, the process was too long. There was duplication, um, not very much engagement with stakeholders. So again, we've looked to address that. Um, there was inconsistency in terms of some of the panels uh, and meetings. Um, solutions needed to be worked, uh, reworked. And again, some changes seem to just disappear and people didn't know where they were, what stage of the process they were, were they being worked on, et cetera. So, um, a project team was set up to review some of these um, issues, basically. Um, so the, the task force uh, basically spent about six months, I believe, reviewing outstanding changes, clearing backlogs, making sure people were aware of what was going on. Um, all of the documentation, all of the guidance was reviewed and improved. Um, we looked at um, Schedule 5 of um, the REC to make sure that any amendments that needed to be proposed were actually formally documented and changed. Map the change process, uh, tried to simplify it. And again, we used the, t uh, the task force basically just to trial run the process to make sure we weren't just putting something out there um, without it being tried and tested. And again, I'm not sure if any of you were involved, but we did try and engage again with stakeholders and parties to ensure that the process was fit for purpose. Um, and hopefully, you know, you have seen improvements in that. Uh, and finally, we created the change issues group. I think the membership in terms of people that want to uh, or have, have asked for an invite is over 80 now. Um, and I think it sort of follows hand in hand with the rate issues group where it started quite sort of slowly uh, interaction was quite limited the rec issues group now is established and it's it's working really well and i think that's what's happening with the change issues group as well so people have the opportunity to discuss changes raise issues and talk through uh, any amendments that they want to um, discuss basically um, and again just following on a bit more about the change that we put in uh, 167 again this is uh, quite a historical change now but basically, um, it's really following up on what I've just said. It was putting things in place on a formal basis. So making sure that uh, we put in place some of the, uh, the findings of the uh, improvement project, um, removal of, I suppose, areas that we thought weren't worthwhile. So the preliminary change report was, um, was removed. We wanted to create some sort of flexibility in the process as well. So it wasn't as rigid as it, um, it had been in the past, but what we were trying to make sure was it didn't create more work for people that were proposing changes that it wasn't going to put them off. Um, again, we uh, were looking to make sure that we didn't remove any engagement within our sort of rec code. So the service providers and other codes still had that input. Um, and also we wanted to make sure that um, we didn't remove any information that was currently shared in, uh, in documentation because I think that's uh, all very worthwhile and useful. Um, again, don't know if you know uh, or have seen what the new process is. I won't show you the old process, but this is a very, very high level of uh, what the new process is. Um, again, we tried to simplify it. So we had a submission of a change or an issue. If it was treated as an issue, then we would try and do the 
I guess, the, the groundwork up front. So we try and determine whether it was actually a valid issue, whether it's going to move to the next stage and whether it actually would become a change. If it wasn't, it would potentially be rejected or withdrawn or it would be reviewed again until it actually potentially became a change. Um, so I guess what we're trying to do is do that work up front. So we're not going through a change process where a change has been um, <clears throat> created. We do a lot of hard work realize actually all that hard work wasn't worthwhile because it's not going to go anywhere. So that should take away some of the sort of the work at the front end if we think that it's not going to go anywhere. Again, I thought this would be quite useful. I think we've been asked this question a few times, so um, I just wanted to sort of highlight what the difference is between a, a code issue, an operational issue and a change, because again, I think people potentially were getting a little bit confused with well, how, how, you know, how do I raise an issue? What is an issue and what is a change? So again, I'm not going to read that out word for word, but basically a code issue uh, is a problem that affects the rules and principles of the REC. An operational issue is a problem that affects the day-to-day -day operation of the REC. And a change is a problem or a concern that's encountered while operating under the REC, but it has a fully defined solution. Um, and then really just to, to rattle through some of the benefits. I mean, again, I've talked through some of those, so I'm not going to talk through all of those, but I think some of the things uh, I wanted to highlight is I've talked about the change issues group. There's a real high amount of engagement within that now. We've seen increased engagement in the change responses and uh, when proposals go out there, sometimes we've sort of got into, I know it sounds a bit bit strange but double figures for responses in the past we may have had none or one or two responses and they potentially were minimal in terms of detail now we're getting some quite significant responses which is really good for the team because they can review that understand you know what what stakeholders think about this and then adjust the change accordingly so that's a real positive um, we have SMEs assigned to each change so basically when a change or an issue comes in we have an SME from the performance assurance team, an SME from the technical services team and an internal SME. So we're not leaving the analysts to sort of work out what needs to be done and, and be trying to find some support They're Basically, they've got something that they can go to from, from the start, um, basically. Um, we've also introduced um, weekly planning and prioritization meetings. So internally, we can review actions, we can discuss and review change proposals. Um, any new issues raised, um, talk about the change issues group agenda, um, and then again, get any updates on derogations, code roadmap, um, the technical change pipeline and cross code activities. So we're trying to improve the communication internally before uh, we go externally. We've also in, uh, introduced a change advisory board. So again, uh, it gives us a forward view of the change pipeline. Um, we can look at resource availability, uh, we can look at any new rig referrals, uh, any submissions that have not yet been accepted, and again, any new changes and issues raised. So that's all really positive, I think. Uh, I'm all for communicating and being open and honest and making sure that we all work with, our, with each other collaboratively. So again, we will continue to work closely with the technical services, RECO uh, and Performance Assurance to uh, ensure continuous focus on this. And internally as well, we have regular best practice and continuous improvement workshops. So as a team, we're constantly reviewing things, constantly making sure that um, I suppose the tools and systems in place are suitable for purpose. Uh, we're looking at our internal trackers. We're looking at software to try and improve how we're tracking uh, and how we're, we're managing our, our changes and issues internally, because again, um, some of it's quite clunky. So there is software, there are there are solutions out there that we need to review and look at, and that's what we're doing on a regular basis. Um, and again, finally, I guess we're working alongside RECO um, in terms of the wider industry programmes, such as preparation for Mark <laughs> Half Hourly. So again, there's no nasty surprises. We've got Harriet who's going to come in. Uh, she's been working very closely with RECO just to make sure that we're prepared for that um, programme when it goes live. And again, um, very briefly, I just wanted to sort of try and highlight, it's a bit small, so apologies for that, where we were, um, I suppose, almost just over a year ago, in July 2023, before this project took place, um, and where we are now. Um, at the top, as you can see, hopefully, 52 inactive changes, 
I, I think that's basically the black hole that we were referring to. Those have now been addressed and reviewed. They've either been withdrawn as changes, worked upon, um, but we, we've tried to get everything out of an inactive phase um, and we'd implemented 50 changes, basically. Um, if we fast forward to now, we've doubled that count in terms of implemented changes, which I think is a, a really significant achievement for the team. Um, there's nothing inactive. Quite a high number have been withdrawn. Most of those have come out of the change improvement project. And then we've got quite a lot in progress, uh, whether they're in an initial, initial assessments or consultation or final assessments. So um, I think it shows that things are moving. I think there was a lot of feedback to say things were stuck. Um, there's a lot going through this month, um, which is really positive. But I think it just is trying to highlight to you where we've, where we've come from and where we are now. Paul, you say there's none inactive. There's, there's, there's eight on hold there. Are they the ones that are related to the MHHS change freeze? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. And again, finally, this is just a quarterly summary position. Again, uh, it's just explaining that things are going through the pipeline. Um, there, there's a constant stream of changes that are going to be coming through. Some will continue to be potentially withdrawn um or go through the whole change process from initial assessment through to implementation but again in the last quarter we've implemented let's get my math right 12 uh, new changes um so again it's just an ongoing process but again we'll appreciate any feedback from yourselves this afternoon or whenever in terms of how the process is working uh, and anything you'd like to see to improve that we're always open to suggestions thank you Fantastic. Uh, any Slido questions at the moment, Jenny? Um, not at the minute. I don't. It's just loading now. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, no questions. <laughs> no questions Thanks. at the minute. Uh, just a reminder then while we, uh, uh, while I do something on mine, that, uh, that is the Slido code to join uh, and the QR code. So if you do have any questions you ask, the best way uh, to do that is going to be through, uh, uh, through asking um, on the Slido link as well. Wonderful. All right. Uh, can, then, can I ask a quick question? Of course. Did those stats include issues that you were just showing? They did. And um, I would have liked to have tried to show a breakdown uh, between the issues and changes. I think to date, we've had over 40 issues raised, yeah. 45, I think, or so. So, yeah, the, the next stage is for me to break down between changes and issues because I think it's been a quite a roaring success. It's just yeah yeah there's been a lot more issues raised now change than changes so. i guess and how do you prevent the same situation developing from that proliferation of issues you're saying 50 raised already yeah more going to come agreed um it's a tricky one because again uh we need to analyze and make sure that the issues being raised are reviewed addressed um potentially rejected potentially move forward so um, we've we've made sure that we've allocated the issues as pretty much within a few days of the issues being raised to an analyst to review and I suppose understand the validity. Um, but it is going to be a challenge in terms of how many are coming through, and if we need more people, potentially we're going to have to have more people to make sure that we aren't in the same situation as we were before. Okay. And how do you ensure the rec the sort of correct parties are engaging with those issues changes? Um, I, I guess we've got um, the issues groups, yeah. so we try and um, sort of communicate through the issues group. Uh, we've got the portal, so we try and send uh, out to anyone who wants to be engaged with the weekly bulletin. Um, and again, uh, I know there's uh, parties that we communicate with on a regular basis and sort of ask for their feedback, especially if the proposer um, is yeah, the, the person that's basically wanting to post that issue, we want to make sure that they have their feedback and then we get feedback from industry. But it's mainly the portal, it's mainly the uh, weekly bulletin uh, and then the issues groups to, to try and get as much feedback as possible. There are always some rep parties who naturally engage much more than others. Part of the strategy that Shelley's team's working on at the moment is looking at those parties. That, and we're obviously preaching to the choir here today because you are engaged because you're at the, the engagement session. It's ironic that we we really want to engage with those who don't come up into these sort of sessions. But Shelley's team are working to identify who those less engaged parties are and putting strategies in place to make sure that they are 
at least aware of the changes that are going on, even if they're not responding to them. So there's there's, there's different approaches that we're taking. Them I think I think a bigger issue that we're trying to address, and it, uh, this is specifically for the OEM to try and to to cover, I guess, is one consistent message that we're getting from all rep parties is just the sheer volume of stuff that's happening at the moment, and it's how those parties know where to direct their attention. Yeah. So there is definitely discussions happening as to how best we we kind of funnel the information that's happening. So we're starting to look with the OEMs in a ways of kind of encompassing and delivering lots of sound bites so that you're you're aware of what's going on without having to be fully engaged all the time to enable you to focus your attention. So it may be, although the change issues group is getting an awful lot of interest, which is brilliant, there are some parties that just don't have the time. So it's not that they're unengaged, but there's the times where they have to make a choice and the choice is not to engage with that at that time. So it's really having lots of information available in lots of areas that's easily to digest to enable you to kind of to, to, to pick and choose. But we are really trying to to understand that and, and do what we can to highlight what we think is relevant to what parties at the right time. But just to add another avenue, which I should have remembered, Mr. Shelley, OEMs are obviously another way of yeah. making sure that you uh, hear about what's going on. So yeah. if you have regular conversations with your OEM, they should be giving you those updates about issues or changes coming down the line. And RFIs and consultations. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, can I ask a really practical question? I'm slightly confused about the relationship between I's and R's. Um, so, because I kind of thought, started off thinking there would be a progression from issue to change. So anything that was ever implemented would become a change before it got into an implementable state. So is that still the case? So it's not two parallel systems. No. How does the numbering work? Because of the sequential, it's completely sequential thing. So an I can turn into an R, but it would keep the same number. So and basically, if, if the, the next change or issue that comes up is going to have the next sequential number that is available. Right. If it, so it always keeps its number, but it's letter may right. change. Right. Right. Okay. So we didn't start at issue 0001. Yeah. We started yeah. at issue. Because I kind of I, I was kind of following the R's and thinking, where did, where did those 10 go? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's because they're all like, yeah, yeah. Yes. it makes and, and you'll see that now, yeah. through more complex. I think, again, they can have. As we've said, there's been a lot of issues yes. raised that you'll gradually see it now going through the process where they're changing to ours and you're hoping yeah. to see the benefits of yeah. what's happened. But not all, issue, not all issues necessarily will become no. a change no. because no. there no. might no. be an alternative approach to be taken that doesn't yeah. include forward yeah. change. That makes, sense. that makes sense. And then so if I may, just one follow-up as well. Yeah. You talked all about different types of, you know, where to direct particular changes. Yeah. Um, if if you wanted to propose a change to performance assurance arrangements, which route would that go down? Um, again, through the same process. So if you raised it on the portal or if you spoke to your OAM or if you raised it in the issues group, we'd I guess assess it and work out which party would be a responsible party. So whether it would be the technical services, performance assurance, right, or okay. us yeah. to which would be sort of the initial triage right before. Okay. Yeah, passing on. Yeah. I think essentially the, the only key difference is if you have if you know there's um something that isn't quite working right within the code arrangements, but you don't know exactly what the solution would be, you're likely to raise an issue which will allow the code manager to know that there's something that he's addressing and triage it to the right place to be addressed. Yeah. If you, on the other hand, have you know what needs to be you know what the solution needs to be, you've got something that needs to be fixed and you know how you want to do it, you're in a position where you may be able to go down and raise a change to say, yeah. this is how the code needs to change to reflect a new solution. Yeah, makes sense. Just to let you know what my team has shared, I think, on the team's chat for this. Or no, I think it was just... Oh, right, uh, specifically to yourself, uh, the breakdown between issues and changes. So just for your information. Uh, again, maybe we can share that later yeah. in the wider cool. chat. We've also got a Friday question that's popped up for you as well. Um, so it's what's the difference between impact assessment and consultation and are both steps always followed? Good question. Um, I probably would resort to one of my team here um, if they're online and then they can ask uh, answer that question because they're probably closer to the actual details of that process. Hopefully they are listening in. So impact assessment will come a lot um, sooner. Oh, Alice is at the back of the room as well. Oh, like. Hi, exchange, yeah. yeah. exchange analyst. Hi, Emily Sandy. You want to come up front? So yeah, you can see us. Sorry, that was awkward.
<laughs> Gave a little wave. Um, so difference between impact assessment. So I use that as a we're asking questions to try and develop that business case. So to understand, should this go through? Is this something that I don't know? I need to find out how much it's going to cost you, what benefits it's going to bring. So that's what I use that step for. And then by the time that gets to consultation, I just want, yeah, have we followed the right steps? Are we good? And so it's a little bit more of a tick box once you get to consultation. Um, so when we need both of those, it will follow the two. Now, if I don't know, because it needs to move rapidly, we might use both of those steps within consultation. So it really does depend on the nature of the change, um, if it's controversial, if we're not sure, we just don't know what the benefits are, we'll use both. Um, if it is just a, yeah, we, we already understand, We've, it's gone to an issues group, we don't need the extra information, we know this is a this is a goer, we'll just move direct to consultation. So impact assessment is optional, consultations are optional, um, but sometimes we use both, sometimes we use one. Impact assessment always comes earlier in the process um, and it's following the consultation that the uh, all the responses will be aggregated into the change report, which then goes to the responsible committee, be it the change panel or the mutual expert panel, or performance assurance board, and they'll look at all those responses and the code manager will have made a, re a recommendation at that point following a consultation to say, yeah, We've looked at all your responses from industry. We recognise there is a cost benefit case that the objectives have been facilitated and we recommend this change is put forward. Um, and, and, and then the responsible committee makes its decision on, 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 the, on the basis of the code manager's recommendation, whether to agree with it or to or, to, or, to, or otherwise to disagree with it. Um, just a follow up, same person here asked that question. Um, we're just asking, would it be possible to notify participants of the intended plan for each change? The change proposal plans um, are taken to the responsible, or to the change panel, sorry, for every change at the start of its journey. So the code manager will recommend what the change proposal plan will look like, um, and that will be published on the rec portal. Um, and the, in the next stage, which is likely to be an impact assessment or a, or a further bit of solution development, um, that change proposal plan will be publicised through the change bulletins um, and on the portal as well so you can see what the expected route for any change will be. So if you haven't already, subscribe to your change bulletin which comes out at midday every Friday um, and every time that a change proposal plan has been through change panel and been agreed or indeed been back to change panel to be amended, you'll be notified of, of what the, the expected steps for that change will be. Again, ask your OEM as well if you're unsure because they're there for support or the service desk. Yeah. That's all the questions from Slido. Thank you. Fantastic. If you've got any more questions about change, obviously you can send them for the panel. Paul will be more than happy to help you. Delighted to be joined by Mark Loveday um, from RECO. Um, Mark's going to be speaking to us today around the best work that oh, RECO yeah. are undertaking at the moment. Mark, Great. thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, <coughs> Sorry, I'm a bit late. I was due to speak first, actually, but um, just so people know, there's a tube broken down on the circle line if you're thinking about getting home. <laughs> <laughs> so I did jump in a taxi. A really, really friendly taxi driver, but after 25 minutes, I didn't think he's not taking the most direct route to the to the location, but I'm here now. So energy theft and reco, what, what were we involved in? So there's a financial aspect to energy theft, but we are primarily concerned with the safety aspect around it all. So I think at the moment, the kind of financial aspect, the impact on the British economy with the energy theft, gas and electricity equates to about £50 per household's energy bill. So it's certainly not inconsequential. But I think the more compelling reason for us is we've seen recently reports in the North East about gas explosions. We know that there's fatalities every year and injuries and those injuries are rising that are related to energy theft. So it's the prevention of injury and the prevention of death that we are really, so not, not solely concerned in, but primarily concerned in. And the way that we think about it is through three phases. So it's through prevention, detection, and then response. And we're looking to try and build that virtuous circle around those three elements. So when we think about prevention, and prevention is clearly our, our main concern is it's, it's clearly the most beneficial element of it. So we work with a marketing company um, 
we used to outsource it. We used to outsource it through Crime Stoppers, but we felt that the marketing and the kind of communication around energy theft was so important that we'd like to have a little bit more control around it. So we've moved from kind of working with that marketing company through Crime Stoppers to having a direct contractual relationship. So we have quarterly and annual updates with the marketing company. But basically, they run a Stay Energy Safe campaign and they do it through radio, social media, other aspects, newspaper adverts, local paper adverts, that kind of thing, just to really extol the dangers of theft, but equally to allow people to understand how they can detect it, how they can prevent it and how they can report it. They get about an average of 600 hits on their social media account every month, so people have clearly got a bit of interest in energy theft, hopefully how to prevent it rather than joining in. But it's also a case that we um, that leads to tip-offs as well which takes us to the detect element. So we work really closely with the Crime Stoppers, primarily uh, as our detection agency. So Crime Stoppers have got a huge presence within the UK. Um, they are very supportive, very keen uh, on working on energy theft. Obviously, their remit is, is much, much wider around tip-offs, but they've got a number of contact centres with dedicated staff that can deal with energy theft. And at the moment, we're getting about up to between 1,500 and 2,000 reports a month around energy theft that we then think about how we can action and respond to, which takes me to the third element. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we've got the kind of prevention element, so we've got that kind of engagement piece. We work with Crime Stoppers primarily, but with other providers as well, and I'll come on to that a little bit, about how we detect it, and then we want to respond to it. And primarily, we want to respond by working with suppliers about how we can prevent that energy theft or once it's detected or reported, how they can respond to it. So we've got the Theft Detector Incentive Scheme. That is exactly what it says on the tin. Incentivize suppliers that once they get reports of energy theft coming in, that they do something about it to prevent it going forward. Um, through the TD scheme this year, we've seen a 25% uplift on reported thefts and response to those thefts that we saw the year before. So again, I think it's a good indication about the fact that, that fact of economic, economic environments changing. Energy theft isn't seen in a lot of quarters as a particularly um, detrimental, a particularly antisocial crime. You know, I think there's a feeling that if people can you know, get one over on suppliers that they think are making multi-billion pound profits, etc. that it's not, whilst not socially acceptable, it's not something that people have a really allergic reaction to. And equally, it's not high on the police's agenda. It's not high on their priorities. The police are very open about the fact of that there's a lot of other crime that they need to deal with, with limited resource. So energy theft isn't high up there, but we are going to do some work in that space as well. So these are the kind of things that we've been working on. So as I say, we've worked directly with our uh, market service provider now to try and put a little bit more, kind of oomph, a bit more direction about where we'd like to see that marketing going. We did have a proof of concept across the course of the previous year where we asked Crime Stoppers to introduce the concept, well, the actuality actually, of a network engagement manager, which was a physical individual that worked with trade associations, industry bodies, to understand whether or not kind of getting that out there in an individual basis would lead to more detection, and more prevention. We've just finished that proof of concept. I don't think we'll continue with it because I don't think it quite produced the dividends that we would like to see, but it doesn't preclude us from doing other things with other bodies to think about how we can prevent theft going forward. So one of the things that we are doing is obviously we've got the energy theft tip off service. That's basically the website and the um, phone line into into Crime Stoppers, but what we want to do with those tip-offs is to make sure that we can supply the best information to suppliers, but then encourage them through the Theft Detection Incentive Scheme to take any action that, or the most action that they can to respond to that theft and prevent, prevent future theft. And one of the feedbacks we're getting about the Theft Detection Incentive Scheme, it's a bit static, it's an annual scheme, it's a bit kind of binary and it probably doesn't quite reward in the right way. So what we're looking to do is to understand whether or not we can make that scheme a little bit more agile and whether or not we can make it a little bit more representative of the efforts that suppliers are making. So one of the things that we're thinking about is whether or not at the moment suppliers are rewarded or not on, so they either, they're either paid or they're paid to the scheme. 
and that's based on the success of the response to the investigations that happen. But obviously, if they are successful in that, they might make more out of the scheme. But it doesn't mean that the it doesn't mean that it properly doesn't mean that it potentially represents all the actions that suppliers are taking. So suppliers might take uh, actions ahead of any theft occurring that prevents that theft occurring, which is a hugely beneficial thing, but currently not really recognised in the scheme. So we're trying to make sure that the scheme's adept at recognising the efforts that suppliers are putting in to prevent theft as well as the prevention itself. The other things that we're looking to do as part of that is we're looking to get more engagement and training out. So we've had a lot of feedback from suppliers saying, and other industry bodies, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, you want to prevent this theft, help us a little bit, develop our own skills and knowledge, help us kind of have the right forums in place to make sure that we can face into the issue as, as, as well as we could do. So one of the things that we're doing is we're working with, delighted we're working with the RPA, I'm sure you might speak about it later, to have, understand how we can make sure that everything that could be done in the theft prevention space is being done. So how can we reconcile the reports of theft into the action around theft, into the prevention of it, and then into the rewarding of that prevention and just making it that kind of full journey? <clears throat> and the ways that we're doing, one of the ways we're doing it is we've introduced a new forum called the Theft um, information group which is basically just drawing experts from the field or interested parties into a single group just to think about things that we can do differently and the other thing that we're doing is we are um just move on <clears throat> so other areas that we're looking at that are tied into that is we've got the um we've already got the theft we've got the uh, energy theft Reduction Expert Group, which was easy for me to say, remember, <laughs> which, is, which is a group of experts, as it says, that come together on a bi-monthly basis and just think about theft, think about theft prevention, think about things that we can do differently. The TIG, the New Theft Incentives Group, is meant to be complementary to that group. So as we think about certain incentives, we can deploy into that thinking and we understand what the landscape as a whole looks like. <clears throat> One of, one of the things that's coming out of that already is that suppliers have said that we just want to know more. We want to know about more about our obligations under the under the REC. We want to know more about under Schedule 8, etc. We would like advice around it all. So RECO is working with the code manager to build a learning space, which is basically going to be a physical and virtual environment where people, if they've got questions about theft, about the things that they'd like to talk about, understanding the responsibilities of what assist assistance is out there to help them detect and respond to theft, we have this forum that they can go to. We've also just working with um, an external supplier to build a theft portal group, a, sorry, a theft portal platform, which is a detection, it, it's, it's a portal that illustrates where the propensity for energy theft is occurring and then actions that people can take around it. So suppliers will be able to access this portal, look across it as a geographical region and say, right, these are the kind of areas that theft's happening and whether or not we should align our theft pre prevention efforts to those geographical reasons, regions. We're also exploring whether or not smart data, smart deep meter data can help us. It's still very much in its infancy, but working with various bodies to understand if we can do a bit of analysis around the smart meter data to understand any anomalies in that consumption and whether or not that leads us to the conclusion that theft may be occurring, and if so, how we can prevent it. Uh, we are working on the theft detection incentive scheme, so again, trying to move it from a kind of relatively binary annual scheme into a more agile scheme that better reflects and recognises industry's efforts to prevent theft. And the other thing that we're doing is we are working on a proof of concept with the City of London Police. So I mentioned earlier that the police's priorities aren't hugely around energy theft, but we are going to fund a policing unit that will work with Crime Stoppers, will work with industry, will work with us. So as theft is detected, We've got a kind of dedicated unit that can investigate that theft and understand whether or not that theft's occurred and what actions need to be taken. It won't just be based in the City of London. We will pay that unit to look across the UK as a whole, but hopefully kind of funding that 
police unit and then facilitated with the information from the portal, facilitated with information from Crime Stoppers, etc., to give them the various leads that they need will help reduce theft in the first place, but equally give us quite a lot of analysis about where theft is happening, why it's happening and how it's happening. So those incentives will come down the line next year. So that's a really quick spin through uh, what we're doing and where we are with it all. I don't know if there's any questions or. We do have some. We have some questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the first question is, our data shows 3% of ETOS leads need results in a confirmed theft. Is there any plans for improvement in the accuracy and reliability of them? So I think that we're working with crime stops all the time to try and increase the accuracy of the reporting. I've been to the call centre and it's actually quite difficult because people either give partial information or they give inaccurate information or they don't quite want to share everything that, that, that they know. But what we're looking to do with the call centre agents is to build a better pro forma form that makes it easier for people to report theft, easier for us to report it, and then feed it into that theft detection incentive scheme. So I suppose the, the simple answer to that is we're looking for a better way to encapsulate the information that we see, we receive that's often a bit fragmented so we can make it more usable. Thank you. And then um, another question is, as the technical adjustment for theft is made often when meter, when the meter is made not live, do we have and use visibility of when the meter loses power? Um, I don't know the answer okay. to that, but I can go away and find out. Okay. I, I suspect not, okay. but I don't know for okay. sure. Okay, thank you. They're the only two that we've got so far. Great, right. thank you. One question from Connor. Yeah, I, I talked about um, measures that suppliers take to prevent theft and giving those more recognition. Um, one of the things in, in the non-domestic market, because there isn't an obligation to supply, uh, one of the things that suppliers do is, you know, vet their customers and know their customers. Yeah, uh, and tend to. Uh, some suppliers may thereby, you know, avoid particular classes of customer uh, where, where theft might be more prevalent. I accept it's a difficult thing to recognise, but I, I think we made good progress when we improved the, the domestic, non-domestic split in theft targets. But I just wondered if there was any more work that could be done to recognise the variation of portfolio amongst non-domestic suppliers uh, so that there's a better match between what's a reasonable amount of theft detection, perhaps at yeah, a slightly yeah. more granular level, depending on what types of market suppliers are operating. So we, we are looking to do more work in that D D DPI space. So I don't think it's still entirely clear about what's a domestic customer, what's a small business, yeah. and what, what, what's an IC customer. So we're looking to kind of get a bit more clarity around that. I think if we do that, that will allow a different approach. I think the struggle will always be in the domestic space that we don't want to preclude people from accessing energy. Yeah. So it, it's kind of, you know, in, in the IC space, it's credit worthiness, it's kind of business model, it's all of that kind of good stuff. Whereas in the domestic space, it's a bit different. But I think the first step is getting that real clarity around the DBA piece, working with the code manager now to kind of get that clarity. Welcome to those who have just joined us in the room. Um, I'm joined now by my colleague Anton from the Performance Assurance team, who's going to talk us through all things what's new in Performance Assurance. So for those who don't know me, I'm Anton Moden. I lead the Performance Assurance team as part of the Code Manager. So focus on that with a team of us who specialise in that area. So, can you see my face? Um, Obviously, we're quite a diverse group today with different interactions with our team. I thought it was worth touching on what is performance assurance and why. I appreciate you'll all have different levels of knowledge and familiarity with this. So our focus is considering the risks that affect the market. Those risks arise from consumers. Those risks arise from our participants <coughs> and in the interactions between the market participants. We need a systematic way of dealing with those and to do that we've got a risk-based approach. So you've probably seen a classic risk-based um, risk management based approach where we identify retail risks, we think about how we can measure them, and we then um, where appropriate think about techniques that we could do to influence those risks. I think it's quite important to reflect that this is one part, a really important part of the code manager that interacts with the other parts the performance assurance is highly related to change, sometimes because of change then results in performance assurance, 
or performance assurance highlights a problem or something that's not working that then needs to drive a change. So they really are two sides of the same coin, just in different parts of the parts of the life cycle. Um, our team think about this a lot, but it's important that you you guys can see a bit into our minds. So the kind of things that we're thinking about are where does the code need to change? If we're not getting the right outcomes, but all the market participants are doing what's required in the code, it is possible that the code is the thing that should change. And um, I'm still going to Jackie about some areas areas where that that was the case. Um, it's also important that performance assurance isn't an entirely negative thing. It's also about where the code is working. If it's working, we should leave it alone, right? We should try and keep it stable. There are areas, there will always be areas where improvement is needed, and we should jointly be investing our time and effort in those areas and, and leaving the bits that are working alone for now. Um, I think there is a piece that probably doesn't affect those in the room at the moment so much, but there are outliers in this industry who are having performance that's negatively impacting others. Now, those others could be other parts of the industry. Typically, <laughs> supplier to supplier relationships are an important part of this, but it also could be negatively impacting consumers. Our job is to tackle those outliers and make sure that they meet the minimum market standards or maybe, maybe in a less negative way, make sure those who enter the market are ready to do so and meet those minimum standards. So every time when we're working, we're thinking about those three things. I would assume for a highly engaged audience who join a webinar, who join in person, that you guys are probably thinking about the same sorts of things that we are in the top two. But actually, I think it's important to reflect that that third piece is a piece that we spend a lot of time on and a lot of focus to make sure that we are protecting kind of all parts of the market. Um, one thing that is difficult about the REC is the breadth. I think preceding codes had a much smaller um, set of stakeholders. If we think about how many organisations work in the REC, it's over 1,000. Depending on how some of the, the change processes goes, that could be over 4,000 in, in the coming months. Um, that is a huge and diverse set of stakeholders. We also don't have a magic pound sign where we can identify exactly what the most important things are. So one of the things that is important working with you guys is to try and understand where there are problems that we might not understand the impact on you or the significance on consumers that you interact with to make sure that we focus in the right areas. That will always be a challenge where there is not a unified pound sign that we can use to prioritise our work and we'll always need engagement, adjustment, things like that. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, I think it's important to reflect that we do lots and lots of different things in pockets and you probably interact with a small number of those pockets, but don't see it all. So I thought it was helpful to take from our operating plan where we actually spend our time. And every year we forecast where we think we will spend our time, but obviously we need to adjust to events. So you can see that actually there's four or five equally spread areas where we spend our time. We spend a lot of time with new entrants. A quarter of our time is spent thinking about if entrants are ready for the market, whether they are new parties in the kind of traditional roles we are all so familiar with, or perhaps new types of businesses who are looking to access rec data to fulfill new business models, all of our time is spent assessing those. That is a service that we provide to consumers, but to the existing market participants, because we should all have confidence that people are ready to meet those standards. We spend about a tenth of our time working with existing organisations to make sure they're maintaining that qualification, with the, the kind of largest element of that being some of the more important parties requiring a triennial uh, information security assessment. We spend about a quarter of our time working with the service providers. So I think this is quite an important thing to acknowledge. Whilst we assess all of the parties, we also act on behalf of all of the parties to make sure that they're getting the value and standards that they should expect from the service providers. So we have a team that looks at 
service levels <laughs> every single month, service deviations, remediation plans. They look at upcoming change and readiness. Um, and that is a significant part of our part of our time that is really for you. Um, we spend time monitoring parties um, in lots of different areas because there are lots of different types of types of parties. But actually, we're spending more and more of our time focusing down on the outliers in the industry, making sure they meet the minimum standards and considering how as the market evolves, our work would need to evolve and to just make sure that parties are kind of continuing on that journey. There is one piece that feels transient but has been a, been a long story, which is MHHS. Over the past probably two years, we have gradually spent more and more time on MHHS and we expect that trend to continue as we move through kind of qualification and those kind of activities that we're talking about later. Um, that is a really important area for us. To, again, it's such a huge change for many of us that um, it's important that we all meet those minimum standards. I thought coming here, it's all well and good to try and tell you what we do. I thought I'd try and bring something that was interesting for you, which is a viewpoint on how we see the market. Now, there's a lot of different schedules and a lot of different lenses we could cut this. But for me, three of the biggest areas at the moment that we look at are switching, metering operations, and kind of the, the on site metering. These are the core of the code that came across. They are being, being enhanced with new areas over time, but they are really important still. So when we think about these things, we think about three lenses. The first is the systems that support these, and you'll, you'll notice that that doesn't apply in this case. The processes, as in the code, how people, what, what, how, how they're set out, what's required, and the market participants. So I wanted in each area to give you a feel for how we see things and where we think things need to be pushed off. So to give a visual, each of the bars, I thought if I fill it up like a cup and when the cup is full, then that would be like the best situation we could have when the cup is empty, that's kind of worst. This gives us a visual for where we feel the market is performing at the moment. So in terms of switching, Actually, the, market, the switching systems have been performing fairly well. In the majority of circumstances, the, the systems are working, the performance is there. There are issues in the systems around specific um, groupings of MPXNs that do need to be addressed. And there are some, um, there have been performance issues in the past, but currently we're not seeing those. So we are focusing on making sure those outlier areas are addressed and that the performance is maintained and the support that you get is enhanced. The code processes, again, in the core switching journey, are working. There are outliers where some organisations have some challenges, perhaps have had some inappropriate sales um, sales practices that have led to some consumer harm, but these are outliers, they are not in the main. There are processes that are challenged that Paul and his team are working on finding better solutions for. The classic example for my mind is the prepayment balance transfer, change of tenancies, things like this. We do not, we are not aware of market issues that are not flowed into those change processes. So we feel that as a code manager, there is work in that space, but we don't feel like there's a big gap. Similarly, with the participants, the vast majority of participants are meeting the requirements of the code, mm -hmm. and our work is focused on a small number of outliers. In terms of metering operations, it probably is a different story. In terms of systems, we have found that there are challenges with the standardization of systems, particularly across gas <coughs> and the information flows that arise from them that do result in some data inconsistencies that then cause kind of 
wouldn't say random problems, but problems for other participants that aren't of their making and are not necessarily of their control when they arise. Um, there are significant work underway to address system performance and improve them from the MHHS programme. And I know that in the gasset arena, there's work that probably on a slightly longer time horizon will address some of these, but we need to be aware that not all of this is under the scope of the REC, and we need to work with the systems gradually as we can without too much disruption to the market participants. In terms of the processes, in the main with metering flows, I would say the majority of the processes are working as, as intended, although we have identified some issues in gas that do result in information not being passed all the way along. And there, there is, I think, about four changes in process to try and address these and make it um, smoother and simpler for those involved. I will say this is an area we're focusing on market participants possibly needing to do a little bit more. We are focusing our assurance efforts given this and that we see there is some inconsistent data in the market on reconciling meter data to make sure it's accurate and making sure that those who are responsible for maintaining that get it up to the right standard. Some of that will be influenced by the MHHS process as the systems are changing. We need to make sure that we kind of time our work and do it considerate to the, the kind of change pipeline. But in, in both fuels, we'll be working on reconciliation processes to get that market data um, to a better quality. Um, in the metering ComCop, we have a dedicated um, audit provider service, a metering audit service called Wilcock. They um, work on this and the assurance that we're getting from them is in the main with some need to address defects as they're or assurance issues as they are identified, the participants are meeting the requirements of the code, although you should all know that there are some issues in clarity with ComCop, and again, our change team and RECO are working to clarify that. I guess I've told you some random things about three of the most important processes that we see. The key message here is we're not just looking at the people in the room, we're looking holistically across the piece, and we're trying to identify which bits of the system are working, where they are not, how that can be driven forward, either by change, performance assurance techniques, or, or whatever it might be. To the next one. Our performance assurance framework has been very successful in the past three years. I've been involved in this right from the generation and probably after the first year. I, I wouldn't be able to say that we had huge value that we provided to the participants, but as the, the framework has evolved, enhanced, our relationships with the parties has improved, and the kind of systems and information that are available, we've been able to deliver much greater value. So I wanted to talk about three, three real types of value that we provide. One is identifying the key areas that need change. The second is driving real improvements. And the third is, tackling service provider performance, because that's that's not something that you guys can directly do and we do on your behalf. So in terms of the first, a lot of the performance assurance information has influenced the types of change or improvement programs that RECO deliver so that um, they focus on areas with real identified challenges. And these, these, these vary in scale and scope. Some are more significant than others. So the first example is the change of tenancy process, which was identified as part of our assurance activity, looking at the market objection process. It was also identified through work with Ofgem and other areas, but we identified a real source of consumer challenge and, and some specific cases of consumer harm as, as a market we need to tackle. Now, the, the change of tenancy process is partway through the change process. And um, obviously that needs to conclude before that, you know, that, that, that harm can be tackled. But identifying that was a key output of our work. Um, annulment is a very classic example. When CSS went live, we received information from CSS 
on the performance of different organizations. And we found some strange behaviors in that, in that information. Now, this was very clearly identified as a problem with the code. We found different organizations doing different things. When we looked at the code, it just wasn't clear. It just wasn't clear what they should be doing. We were able to identify that, work with the participants kind of very quickly, provide them guidance and correct the code so that it now says something that's clear, that is consistent and, and, and makes sense. I think without a, a, a team looking at market performance, the code is not able to kind of self-heal in that way. It's a feedback loop that allows us to correct errors of different magnitude. Um, address management is an area that, you know, we've identified improvements have been made in address management over the past few years, but probably we're at a point where a new approach is needed. Our work has been central to that. We talked about gas market communications. I know Mark talked to you a little bit about TDIS. We have seen through the application of TDIS in the, in the past few years, a significant improvement in market participant engagement and greater identification of theft. Now, this theft identification like it is a good thing for many reasons, things like energy settlement and fairness among, among different, different stakeholders, but it's really important because of safety. Every confirmed theft we have is, um, is an opportunity to prevent uh, a significant safety, safety issue later down the line often for those who've got no interaction with that theft themselves. Um, and, and another one, the last one is identifying some challenges with the CSS communication process where a lot of IT teams aren't sure when the gate closure process finishes and identifying that we can get better messages to make it simpler for market participants, whether they're kind of suppliers, DNOs or service providers. These are the kind of things that our team is there to do to try and Get the, get the code manager to identify and self-heal the code. We've driven real improvements as well. We've had a significant success with a data cleanse approach that has targeted a smaller number of um, specific reports. And this has driven up data quality in the industry. The most important thing about that is those costs of data quality issues are passed on to other organizations, for example, when there's a switch. Um, We've talked about driving up real improvements in energy theft. Um, we've responded to information security events that have happened outside of the REC service providers to make sure the impact on everybody else in terms of the provision of, for example, the inquiry services are managed and that those who aren't involved aren't negatively impacted. Um, we've tackled erroneous switches flowing from um, some, some, chat, some problematic sales behavior. And the fact that we get data monthly means that we could do this quickly <coughs> and we could stop an issue before it became a bigger issue, which it might not affect your customers directly, but it does impact mm -hmm. the whole market's perception. Um, we've tackled switch blocking, where organizations were preventing uh, customers from leaving when they had a right to. That, that helps other suppliers, but it also helps the consumer and our joint um, kind of reputation. Um, and we've tackled new entrants who weren't capable. We've prevented organizations taking on too many customers that they weren't able to service without putting in the right systems and processes. We've also looked at service provider performance. We've tackled issues where the responsiveness of services haven't been sufficient and got organizations to put in action plans to drive that up. Um, we've looked at the responsiveness to incidents and, and making sure service providers respond to incidents that are raised by participants like yourselves. Um, and I think the most important thing for me with service providers is, we, is we've taken steps to prevent the recurrence of issues. In the provision of services, issues do happen, but it's really important that our service makes sure lessons are learned and that these things don't recur and that the appropriate systems, controls, processes are in place so that you get the service that you, you should expect. One thing that I do reflect, having worked on this service for about four years now, is that there was an area that we could improve that I think we are improving. 
and I think we need to continue to improve on. And one is the engagement with people like yourselves. We've taken significant steps in the last year to do that. And there are six specific ones here that, that we've really focused on. I think we heard that you want more of a, a human interaction, a human face. And we've spent a lot of time doing that. And in the day-to-day -day processes, more predictability. For our performance assurance techniques that are more routine in nature and less kind of urgent, we've made sure that we consult the industry, both the PAB and the Rec Issues Group, to make sure that we are understanding what's happening in the market and taking the appropriate steps. We have spent more time tailoring our, our webinars so that they're interactive in two way. By the way, I'm looking forward to the less broadcasting part of our interactions later. Um, we've tailored our sessions, recognizing it's a hugely diverse stakeholder group and that some, some of our webinars shouldn't just be for everybody. They should be on a specific topic so people know when to attend and when you know, it might not be quite so relevant to them. Um, we focused on communicating key messages, particularly messages about things people might need to do so they don't get lost in the noise. And that helps those who are perhaps a contract manager who need to make sure they're on top of exact deadlines. Um, we provided more transparency on areas of focus and tried to simplify some of our documents, particularly our risk register, so it makes more sense of what we're doing, why, and how they relate to our core purpose, which is the REC objectives. And I think the last one is, to me, the most important one. We have established a, uh, a process, or I'd say more so trialled, the performance assurance check-ins, where contract managers and the relevant people from, from, from each organisation can have a direct interaction with the assurance service, and that this is a two-way thing. We will naturally be talking about kind of what's coming up and perhaps what they need to do. We'll be talking about performance issues if they do exist, they don't exist in all organisations. Um, but also talk to you about what you're seeing in the market and if there's anything we should be considering for future areas of focus. For me, that is really important part of those. Um, and after our trial, which, which we believe has been successful, we're working with RECO to see if that should be extended for that greater kind of human interaction and less less digital. I think we can we continue to have challenges and need to focus on driving our service to get the best value for the market and for consumers. And I I see four key things that we need to do to get this right. And I'm sure having put this challenge out, a few of you might come across and give me some of your opinions on these things, which by the way, I, I, I welcome I welcome later. I think the first thing that we want to want to be focused on is lifting it up a level. Our work is naturally a mirror of the code requirements and has to focus on what the rules are. Anything else would be unreasonable, right? You need, you need to have a, a clear requirement and assurance of those requirements. I think our focus needs to lift up a level because we are fundamentally interested in the outcomes for different market participants and consumers and how the, the market participants affect each other. I hopefully will be a voice within the code manager to try and lift these up a level to try and get clear ideas of what the key outcomes that we should all be committed to do to give some flexibility. Clearly, some systems need prescribed processes, you need a market message of this format, but focusing on those outcomes will allow us to lift both assurance and the code up a level. I think greater visibility on what we do, but probably more importantly, on why we are doing it. Better connectivity, we talked about, you know, your connectivity with you know, real people, not emails and one-way webinars. And the hardest thing of all, for a performance assurance service in such a diverse code is getting the balance right. For us, this is greater focus on the new. Hearing that message that we get so often, that there is a lot going on, and that that means that we need to be thoughtful about your time, but also on the risks that the service provision, um, the change of service provisions have on you, um, but also continue to focus on the challenged. So those are the kind of four things that we continue, we, we think we focus on to try and deliver our service in a way that kind of 
is more visible and meaningful for you. I think there's a, probably any question slide. There is. Is there anything come through slider? There has been. Oh. Um, are you sharing? Oh, even better. <laughs> <coughs> Have you considered a joined up approach to you? That's for the panel discussion. Yeah, so, okay. that. so the bottom one. Do you believe that the implementation of performance assurance team into the industry has led to an improved consumer outcome? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I think I think I think we we see this as a dual requirement. Consumers are really important, but the ability to find and fix things that might change consumer outcomes and normans is important and to find and fix market or consumer problems like like costs and get those into the change process with the right evidence as a huge benefit for the consumer we need to acknowledge though the consumer is half of our goal we're also interested in the market participants kind of doing their responsibility for when those things are handed over to others we're, we're not interested we're trying to avoid market participants passing half around that is a really important requirement, and that often happens in the world of data. It's often um, a stream of data issues that happen with many parties that then have to get fixed by one organization. And I guess our key focus is let's, let's get it fixed first time at the lowest cost for the industry and by the right organization and reduce that passing around. So that's not for the consumer, although it does have consumer impacts, doesn't it? That's mainly for the market participants. Thank you for the question, Ben. Uh, Ailey, we'll keep your question, if that's all right, for the uh, panel session afterwards, but nice to get some early sight um, of it. Um, so we'll think about that over lunch and we'll come back and, and have an answer for that after the session. Is it worth asking the room? Any, anything yeah. else? Okay. Um, what reporting do you provide into Performance Assurance Board and what powers do they have to hold parties accountable? Um, so we typically provide narrative reports, but we also have a reporting <laughs> suite that we look at that they have access to. Now, I, I, I would probably assume, and we've got, got a PAP member in, 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 the, um, in the room, that they probably don't go through every single part of the dashboards every single month. They're more there if they want to dive deeply, given the expectation. So every month they get a report on every single service provider that, that covers... Rec service provider. Rec service provider, yes. Yeah, all of our work is limited to the, the rec service providers and the parties, rec service users. Every single month they get that. They get a narrative report on the performance of parties every single month, and they get a report on the changes because that that is kind of um, relevant to how we should manage in the future. The, our team provide recommendations to them, and we have a suite of powers in a document called the Performance Assurance Methodology and Techniques document. Bit of a mouthful, but it's it says what we can do. Some of these we are pre-authorized by the panel to do. We don't need a committee to do everything, um, but the more serious and impactful techniques are essentially determined by the PAB, so we would make a recommendation. The kind of things that we typically would do if we see an issue, we might um, then inquire an information request to talk to people about what we're seeing. Um, I think it's quite important in some of our interactions to say, this is what you were seeing. Do you know about it? Do you understand why it is? Is there an external factor we haven't considered? That certainly is probably our main interaction. We can set action plans for the service providers, RECO and DCC, or for the parties. We can get into much more involved techniques where our team go out on site, or virtually depending on the nature of it, and do what, it's not really an audit, but audit would be the right feel for it. Um, we can create specific conditions in the market. I think that's quite an important power that we have. And the most common use we have of that was when new entrants are here, we have a specific condition that they demonstrate certain things until they get to a certain level of registrations. Um, and we can default organisations. The default can involve um, those that are causing harm to others, no longer being able to acquire new customers. So there are quite a lot of, that's like a huge range, isn't it? There is one thing I should point out that we, that particularly many of our PAM members are keen on. We can also provide information. Some of that is to peers. So maybe metering providers see their performance relative to metering providers. Some of that could be in the public domain. I think those act as significant incentives 
and are quite a kind of medium sized incentive. We talked about default and switching, stopping switching. Those are quite extreme things that need to be handled very carefully, but are part of this. We don't go there very quickly. I think we go to more gentle, gentle things first. Um, but having that kind of less intense, medium intensity and more intense uh, techniques and remedies is quite important. And getting the PAMS view on like the proportionality of each one is really important. Okay, cool. I've got another question, if that's okay. Cool. It's around uh, audits and ComCop. So, okay. Apologies if it's not the right time, but I'll ask it anyway. So, go. yeah, yeah. Uh, ComCop focuses on the like physical entering yeah. activity. Are there any plans in the future to kind of more than that to back office flow sending timeliness? Yep. So, it's it's there, already. It's there already. So there is a bit on that, but I would say the predominant focus on ComCop is not in the back office. It's mainly on the kind of on site. I think that is a fair. Yeah. Yes. A lot of the flow yeah. stuff in Schedule 14. Yeah. The metering operations is something we have had different approaches to. And in our December webinar, we're going to go through, and you should come, James, um, our strategy for looking at metering flows as well as some presentations on that kind of con copy elements. We have seen, and you, you saw my kind of part filled glasses, we've seen that there is inconsistent flow sending across the market from flow level analysis and the provision of data from what we now call MOAs and MAMs. Yeah. Our solution to that has partly been the change, but I think there is also some requirement for improved data quality and reconciliation. In both markets, gas and electricity, our focus at the moment and going forward will be completing regular reconciliations of the underlying data and getting those that um, populated that data to get it back up to the required level. So if you have, like if you've got great data, then there might be some 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 work to be involved in the reconciliation, but the remediation elements will be lower. Um, but if you've got challenges in your data, not only will you have to remediate, but you'll also have to work out how you can stop those problems, prevent them. In relation to the data quality aspect of yeah. it, obviously there's been some reports been sent out to relevant parties to correct this data. Yeah. What we've noticed is that data that's been provided is almost six months old, um, which means obviously, as we know, consumers can change every 24 hours and things like this. It's now a lot of it's probably not relevant. Um, so it's not like the most useful information for parties to rectify. So there's a lot of work. So for an example, the data that we've been provided, there's over, I think, like 13,000 rows of data yeah. that we need to action. But what we're starting to do as we're obviously investigating this discrepancies, a lot of it, we're no longer as a map, we're mapped, you know, sort of thing. So it's not relevant to us. So well, I think in gas, that probably is a relevant critique. I don't think that is relevant in electricity. Um, I think that is true, and some of the issue here has been us working to get provided access to that information from the REC service providers. Now, our intended future on GATS is to get some reporting from Exaserve so that we don't have to ask Exaserve to do some reconciliation provided to us, and that does take time, right? The more handoffs there are, the more time there is. So you guys can get kind of, I don't know, it's almost like less latency. There is some latency. There's a bit of latency you're talking about there. We need to reduce that. I recognise that. Um, and because because of that, we want to take that in house. But I, I do think that is a genuine issue that needs to be addressed. In electricity, we will be taking a different approach, where we will be reconciling to um, the electricity inquiry service. Because of what you've spoken about, we have a difficult decision timing. There is a massive trade off. Every time we put something out there, we get conflicting views on this. There's a trade off between reducing latency, being able to see a very clear curve of improvement, doing things frequently, versus the cost of you guys doing that. That, that comes back to that kind of balancing stones. 
that is really hard. Your latency would have been addressed if we had more frequent work. If we had more frequent work, you'd have to do more work, wouldn't you? There is a balance there that we are trying to strike. What we will end up doing, I think, is initially more frequent, frequent work in electricity, ideally dialing that back. If, if we can get to the point we're comfortable in the data, I think we need lower latency in gas, and we probably need something a bit more frequent than once every year. It, it genuinely is a trade-off, and every single time we put out a change, we get people saying <laughs> things like, we, we only think you should have aggregated data, or you should be able to provide the detail backing to us. We get conflicting views, and we need to get that balance right. In gas data, the balance is more frequency. That's definitely how I see it. <laughs> the other challenge is the fact that if there are data that needs to be rectified, some of the data that needs to be rectified isn't relevant, like not our responsibility as an example, it would be driven from another party. Now, if we are part of our, I believe, responsibilities that we've got to notify them and yeah. tell them to do this, but what we're finding, nothing then is actioned as part of those things. My, what, what I would like to understand is what power, it, what is done from there, you know, sort of thing. If we're passing on the information to be rectified, but nothing's being done, what, what can we do, do you know? <laughs> so I think all of our techniques with data cleanse, this has worked a bit more in switching, have been evolved over time, and things like this have come up. I know Mark's pointed out as how in several areas, you know, these things, uh, perhaps could be nil return or checked once or will never get finished. It might be in gas. Maybe we spend a little time later thinking about where we can think of groups of those cases that can have the appropriate treatment. But you're right. It's about getting the right action to the right organisation. And if you're allocated something that's not yours, it's, it must be frustrating. But it's, it's, it's great the idea to do this because data is very key to everything, is. you know, but if nothing is pushed on the relevant <laughs> parties that need to rectify these things, yes, there might be cost, but obviously that still needs to be dealt with, you know, and I think the problem is, is there's a lot of drive to get these things done, but then nothing comes from it as such, you know, there's no further actions from there, you know, on individuals. There's no further action. Yeah, people yeah. don't rectify, people don't do these things you know when they're being told to do it and I, we don't see a lot of follow-up or any sort of oh this has now been actioned you know sort of thing so i would say over the years we've been doing this we probably are there in market segments but clearly like if you're telling me this is real right <laughs> we are there in market segments and part of that has been picking that balance so with a lot of the data that came across following switching, we initially said to lots of people, you know, can you do it all? We've had significant improvement in performance by focusing on a smaller number of reports in sprints and work because we can then have people start working the data and they can then come back to us and talk about this is where it's worked and this is where it hasn't. Crucially, if you're given a reasonable time frame to do it, and you are not making progress, we have kind of a clear evidence base that suggests that there needs to be some of those techniques that James talked about, or I talked with James about, <laughs> which are probably more into the lower and medium sized sanctions in this regard. But those in the switching area who haven't been cleansing have been set remediation plans, action plans, and their performance has been kind of highlighted in the industry. It does sound like we need to spend a bit of time together in the gas to make sure that we work on that together. But it is important that if you're not playing your part, that you have um, consequences. It cannot be the only, like, there cannot be a penalty for good behaviour of doing the extra work, right? <laughs> it has to be the other way around. Well, did those get reported as exemptions? So if, so if it was a man in that case, uh, in that case, couldn't have day to day try to because it's that, that's an exemption, isn't it? And then you would look up the so, so I be sent, wouldn't you? I don't know if there was a suite of exemptions that are relevant in the gas, that's why I kind yeah. of had to think about that. But that has been our mechanism in other parts of the industry to have exemptions. 
Um, I, th I think we need to recognize that a lot of this data, you can get so far and it gets harder and harder and harder, and there does need to be some common sense there, but that's different from doing nothing, right? And we need to treat the organizations who are driving us forward and improving the data you know, with their thanks. And that's been really important to me in the data cleanse that every single person who's met their target has had a thank you from our team, but also with some practicalities. We'll be talking about this in an address in a couple of days where for practical reasons, you can't change that address. It's as good as it could be. We need to kind of mark it as done and move on. And, and you know, there's different types of data, isn't there? But exemption requests and things like that are the right way of dealing with these kind of edge cases. Just picking up on a comment about exemptions, the whole concept of exemptions came from FMRS. That's where it started. I'm not aware, and I might be wrong, that any new ones for any of the new RecPAB reports have been added to that list of exemptions because the exemption is an exemption number for a report type. Um, so I'm not sure that any of them You might added. be right because when I was looking at the updated guidance the other day to try and find the ones that we should be doing as a man for the meter meter type model manufacturer, I was a bit confused. Yeah, they don't, they don't, they don't, they, as far as I know, they don't yeah. exist and you have to apply to get one added to the list. Right, okay. So maybe we're, we're understanding. We, we do need to have a discussion about getting one added to the list. It shouldn't just be a random. It needs to be consistent. Um, I do think with the right information and in the right way, that is an OK thing to do. We want to make sure you're cleansing the right things, right? And we don't want you to be in a position where you feel like you're banging your head against the wall with something that you can't mm -hmm. fix. We also want to know where it's not something in your control. Another market participant might need to ask. We think it is relevant for you guys to go and talk to them. We, we acknowledge that doesn't always fix the situation. That information coming back to us is useful. But I, I think exemption requests and spe specific details of those are things that we could improve. I think they are things that need constant refining. I think it's all documented in the cleansing guidance, isn't it? It yeah, is. A new guidance. version has just come out following the last splint that just started. Yeah, it should and come out with every sprint. There is, I was looking for the gas one specifically, that, and I did. I couldn't work out which one I should be using for certain things. So my, I'll, I'll take that away and look at it. My opinion is we are in different levels of maturity in different parts of our industry. Yeah, the gas is the first time we've done it, isn't it? So. Exactly. I think the thing that you're talking about, Mark, is more established and is, oh, more, yes. is more refined. And we naturally can't get there overnight. Like I would love to. <laughs> I'd love to, right? We will need to get there with gas and electricity metering data over time, and we'll need to do it jointly, right? One of the reasons it's good, Mark, is people like you pipe up and say, well, this exemption doesn't make sense. And we have a discussion about that. And we refine it, right? And that is part of how this should work. I think gas, I think you can probably learn, gas can learn from what electricity's done as it's been going on a long time. Obviously, you've got a different set of problems because of the the the, yeah. uh, the players. I think you can learn something and you don't end up going down the rabbit holes we went down with Ofgem when data client cleansing started for FMRS, that the right reports go to the right parties with the right people being responsible. Um, as an example, um, if you look at the reports that are issued, invalid top line. Yeah. That got chopped into two, DNO responsible, supplier responsible. Yeah. Because one can deal with one set, one can deal with the other. Originally, it was one list and who does what. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think yeah. gas will end up the same way, but it's going to take time to get there. I mean, I've seen the list of gas. I mean, it all comes through me. And there is a huge list on gas. And I, I would agree that some of it will be out, would have been out of date long before we got the report, but we're going to have to work through it. I, I think that is true. I think you need to know that we want to reduce that latency. To do that, we want to take some of the information, the uh, extract information from Exaserve so that we can reconcile things quicker, provide them to you quicker. I think that's important. But our sprint process has been really successful in FRMF, has been really successful. Part of it is that we go and say, this is what we're going to do, this is what we think the target is. And some people say, mm, and we listen, right? I'm pointing to Mark again. I was going to say, it's okay. <laughs> I'm going to get a lot of blame here today, I know. No, because, no, right? I think people will probably thank you. But I think that is important. I think in the gas metering world, we were at the start of that journey. We did apply common sense. Originally, we wanted to sprint at all. And we learned from, from a particular PAM member who said, won't it be more effective if you focus on three and still see what's going on with the others? 
I think that is helpful in case something something goes really wrong. We can we can talk to people about it. That needs to be where we're heading in gas lands. And when we're reconciling electricity, MOA data, that will be, need to be where we're going as well. I'm loath to cut short, very useful question and answer session, but we do need to move forward the agenda. Please do keep your questions in mind, raise them on Slido, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss them in the Q&A session. And then Anton's going to be in a room after uh, the Q&A session as well um, to, to answer any specific forms of assurance questions you might have. Ailey, your question, I think it kind of covers both change and maybe the form of assurance side as well. Yeah. Maybe we'll discuss that under, under the Q&A when we got a panel in front of us, if, if, if that's all right with you. Thank you, Anton. Really appreciate it. Um, our final session before lunch is going to be with respect to market-wide half-hourly settlement. I'm inviting two of my colleagues uh, forward for this one, uh, and that is Harriet Truss and Dan Rogers. Uh, talk about, I think it's Harriet first, is it? Yep. Just as I go, I do want to speak to you, so do speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> Just... Um, hi everyone, um, so I'm Harriet Truss, I work in the Code Manager, um, predominantly in my day jobs in the change team, um, but I'm particularly focusing on MHHS at the minute, so market-wide half-hourly settlement, just in, just in case anyone isn't aware. Um, Dan hasn't leapt up out of his seat yet because he's going a, um, focusing on qualification in a kind of a follow-on um, presentation, but also Sarah Jones from RECO is here with me as well in case there's any um, questions on the, the finer details. Sarah's in a better position to answer on some of those things. So go to the next slide on the next. Thank you. Um, so I know um, both online and um, in the room there are people who've been um, quite involved with the MHHS programme, but there's probably quite a few who uh, know less. I'm not going to try and present the whole of the MHHS programme and, and what that means, but and focus on a, um, a couple of things. But in terms of um, how REC implementation will work for MHHS, that's been led by a RECO, um, RECO led project, um, and that's headed up by John Hawkins and then Andrew, Johnny, and Sarah, um, kind of the key leads within that team. Then within the code manager, there's myself focusing on the change, governance, and communication side. Um, um, v and Dan um, in the performance assurance team, um, Dan particularly focused on qualification. Um, and then from the technical services side, Beth's the lead um, for their side. And Neil Brinkley is the one who's um, doing all the data specification, loading everything into email, um, that, the, the more technical side of the, um, the market message um, as well. Kind of top level hot topic at the moment is the um, the pushback of the the go live date. This is still subject to off gem approval, but went through the program steering group um, a couple of weeks ago, and it's now the the dates um, in that revised plan of what the program are working to now. Um, and as I say, subject to that um, overall approval from off gem, which we're expecting early December. Um, so originally, so the. I talk, talk around that kind of go live date. There are obviously other milestones within the programme um, when the migration start, when the um, qualification kind of levels are and the, the, the back end of things, the end of the transition and everything. And they've all kind of shifted with it. We originally were targeting the 7th of March um, 2025, um, but the new date is the 24th of September. So if anyone didn't know that yet, that is the, the key date. And that's when the systems are going live, but also from a rep code perspective, it's when the, the code's um, implementation happens as well. That recalibration of the plan um, went through the change request um, process within the programme. And from a rep perspective, we've fed into that. We've looked at obviously the MHHS deliverables, but also the rec changes and everything that we've got in the kind of BAU space as well. There's no kind of significant impact to what we got planned for certain releases or the standard releases um, in plan. Um, but there are a few things that were impacted by the change freeze, um, which um, for those that don't know, that's where it's basically protecting the go live and the implementation of MHHS and the migration and qualification. So things like central switching service testing that although there aren't many changes to um, CSS, um, it is essential to the testing. So if we make changes to CSS messages in the middle, there's things like that. So we have a couple of changes where they're impacted and on hold because of a freeze there. And because the go live date has gone back, the change freeze has gone back. 
and that means that the, the consumer benefits associated with those changes um, obviously are impacted. We are looking at ways that we can potentially get around that, um, but it, it's not guaranteed. Um, obviously, it does mean that we, like from our readiness um, plans and from the um, release preparation or the documentation or the loading into the, the digital code, um, they, they're all being looked at at the moment to see which bits we definitely need to move back, but which bits we can still take advantage of the time available. Go to the next one. Um, We've had um, kind of requests um, kind of more recently about a bit more information on the kind of key impacts for the REC and REC parties. This is a whistle stop tour, obviously. <laughs> MHHS is quite big and um, there's there's only so much time available today, um, but there is other engagement <laughs> plans and I will come to that. Um, so a couple of high level principles. It's a design led programme. So the design came first. There are um, things in the design um, which have consequences for the REC but weren't specified in the design. Um, so there's consequential changes there and both the design and those consequential changes are fed into what's being put into the code drafting. And the code drafting is the um, what has been fed into the REC change proposal R0209 and we'll be sending that over to um, Ofgem for the decision on that one later today. Um, so all of the things that I'll go through on this slide and the next slide are um, tied to that go live date of MA and N10. Apart from the performance assurance elements, which may come in a little earlier, but we haven't determined exactly when um, when those are going in as yet. Um, so first, there's four main drivers around what impacts the REC. Um, first of those being the market segmentation moving to advanced um, smart and unmetered and there's different processes and messages that kind of go with that um, and also new market role codes for the for the um, services that go with that as well um, the there's a new dependency on the registration service for sharing information um, and that's um, particularly around agent appointments and meter technical details there's the new data integration platform which i'm assuming most people will have already heard about and that's a new form of um, new form of market message, which will be replacing some of the DTN flows. And also um, there's impacts on so like the existing DTN flows that aren't being removed as well. And then just the nature of the data integration platform, the DIP, um, means that some of the messaging and the communications have a much shorter time frame than they currently do, um, reducing that to kind of one to two hours. Um, meter technical detail still has a a longer and um, free working day time frame on that. Thank you. So it's a little bit smaller, hopefully you can see that in the room. But um, so the, the key kind of um, impacts are the switching impacts, not to the CSS process, but how the how the um, how the switches are communicated afterwards, and that's via the dip. There's, although this impacts parties less, um, the appointment of MEMS currently gets communicated through CSS um, through to the um, SMART kind of DCC side, SMART DSP. Um, and that's now also going to include the SMART meter data retriever. And that's the part that is the service that's going to be actually accessing the meters and getting that half hourly data from them. So it's a new, um, new role within the market. Um, and that, that appointment needs to be sent through so that obviously the um, the DCC can give the right access to the right people. Um, forward and reverse migration, so both um, MHHS qualified participants and um, non-qualified participants need to report the migration processes, so this changes from that perspective. As I mentioned before, changes to market messages, existing DTC ones, later item changes, there's a um, couple of flows with new versions and there's new scenario variants to reflect the new market segments. Um, and I've just kind of flagged there that the, you know, the new um, it is all available in Electrolink for people to access currently. It, it's there in the current version, but they're not operational. They're test, test versions of the flows. Erroneous transfers and supply agreed reads processes have been impacted. The supply number format has been impacted. That's drawn quite a lot of attention. The key data items within the top line um, have been impacted by the MHHS design, 
which means they're no longer available. So we've had to look at that. Standard settlement configuration, time pattern regimes are no longer going to be held um, by the BSC. Um, the new version of MDD, um, industry standing data, won't hold that information. That's going to be hosted and governed in the record. There's lots of changes, obviously, to data items. Um, there's um, there's going to be the non-migrated MPANs and the migrated MPANs. All needs to be reflected in electricity inquiry service. The changes will impact everybody. The web portal is changing, platforming, replatforming. So that's something that, as well as MHHS, everybody needs to be aware of for that one. Um, and then, obviously, the performance assurance. Anton's mentioned that there's lots of activity going on there. As I say, that's a really quick version. There was a webinar back in July um, that you can access via the portal and um, you can find more information there. We'll share these slides so you'll have the, yeah, yeah, the, link, have the link working when we get the slides. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not going to run through that. That's just the snapshot of what's in R0209, all the documents and obviously the, the data spec as well that's, um, that's going to be changing. <coughs> um, so in terms of um, other engagement plans, um, next week there's a qualification mm -hmm. assessment document guides webinar. We won't still that dance thunder, but um, I'm sure there'll be a bit more mention of that um, and what the content of that is. Um, we originally also next week had a um, RECO, we're going to be hosting a, a workshop, face-to-face -face workshop, um, kind of in preparation, so like a full day, basically what I've just whizzed through now. Um, that's now going to be in quarter one, 2025, and we're looking at early February at the moment, but that'll be confirmed and communicated um, kind of later in the year. There'll be a specific training webinar on PES, and that'll be like live demos of what's, what's going on there. And then just to, to really acknowledge that from a release perspective, there'll be the standard kind of pre-release um, communications. It'll be a bit enhanced, but, you know, there will be the normal release information on the portal and everything. Cool. Um, this is just a bit of an opportunity to plug um, the, the MHH, MHHS hub on the portal, running out words, um, in the knowledge centre of, um, of the portal. Paul, I believe, has given you a demo of the, the portal earlier. So, um, yeah, the, we, again, we can send out links. We do do a rec, um, weekly MHHS bulletin that's attached within the bulletins that you should get. So you've probably seen those. Um, and that's where that's hosted. If you want any of the back copies, you know, just contact us if the link's not there. Um, and then it links through to the wiki articles on various things, and we're incrementally expanding the information all the time now. This week it'll be qualification, um, and then we'll be looking at the EES page, release information, um, and around supply and number format and things like that. Yep. Couple of hot topics. <laughs> Question in the room, yeah. For electricity. It is all so we'll uh, talk about is electricity for market wide half highly settlement <laughs> is electricity, yes. There are certain bits within this that, that um gas participants will be and um, want to be aware of, primarily around meter operations. Are the it's not that there are any obligation changes, but in the meter operation schedule, there has been a restructure of the schedule. So we've tried to highlight that and make people aware of that as we've gone through the drafting process. Um, but essentially, currently in the meter operation schedule, there's um, it, the gas and electricity elements are all kind of bit by like each section kind of covers both. We're now it's now separated out separately to gas and electricity. And for the transition phase of MHHS, there'll be electricity migrated and electricity non-migrated. So three separate parts to the, the operational process. Um, so, is, is that, sorry, does that answer the question? Ian? Yeah, I was just trying to get my head round because we only operate in gas. So, I was like, I don't recognise any of this stuff. <laughs> Which, <laughs> fine. <laughs> if you pick up the meter operation schedule uh, in, well, however many months it is, about a year, um, it's going to look quite different. Um, a but lot it, longer. It's a lot longer. Oh, another question. Um, well, a few slides back, you said that the um, 
there'd be changes to the erroneous transfer and disputed reads process. <clears throat> what I'm trying to get my head around here is if we've got a supplier that's migrated and a supplier that hasn't, and the dispute is between those two suppliers, how's that going to work? If that makes sense. The process for operating, like for the mm -hmm. erroneous transfer, would be the same. Yeah. And okay. the, um, obviously, the parties would be the same. So that's not changing then. So that's not changing. The, the, the relative with ETs, it's relatively, um, say, so light mm -hmm. touch. Um, because of the move away from non half hourly and half hourly, the, the, the kind of the mandation of the obligations is on that basis. So with the removal of non half hourly, the, the erroneous transfer process essentially um, applies to all. So it's mandatory for all. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and kind of just to provide comfort on that within the code, there is that, you know, it can be bilaterally agreed. Um, there's a kind of a get out clause, as it were. Um, you still need to go through a, an appropriate process, but it's, it's about that kind of the non half hourly reference is no longer something that we kind of work to um, under the MHHS arrangements. It does also create a bit of an issue with data, doesn't it? Because you don't have set rates for the ET period, so there's going to have to be a solution to use half hourly data for the ET period. I think that's a wreck issue, though, isn't it? I think yes, I can't that's remember the, name, the number yeah. off the top of my head, yeah. but yeah, no, that's that's been raised in. Yeah, there's, there are some kind of fine reference to, <laughs> yeah. for that, yeah. Well, I mean, I've highlighted these things because I know these are the kind of questions coming in through the um, through through the OEMs and also into a, in directly into the project team. Um, I think the key we had originally said that we try and provide some guidance around the um, particularly the standard settlement configuration and the, the top line data items. Um, there are there's a kind of an on hold change request within the program that affects this area. So we're not going to try and create something that could contradict what the conversations are with the BSC going on there. So just in case anybody had seen that we we talked about that before, that's slightly on hold. Um, the supply number, I think most of people's concerns are more related to the data items themselves. Um, but just for clarity on the supply number, that's um, it's tied to, to M8, so it'll go live with, at the same time as everything else. Um, and it's it's a, a big bang implementation, but that doesn't mean that every single kind of account needs to have a, a bill sent out with a new supply number on. It's just as and when that will get produced anyway, that's when it needs to be. R83 has all the details on that. Um, but if there are any questions, um, you yeah, know, please continue to feed them through. As I mentioned, we'll also get a, a wiki page that um, pulls everything together kind of outside the, the CP page as well. The qualification, I'm not really going to say anything because Dan's here um, and I wouldn't want to steal thunder or, or get it wrong because he knows the detail on that one. Um, but yeah, okay. any questions? I think is any more questions? Yeah, there's just um, there's just one question on um, who is the target audience of the REC, uh, of the MHHS engagement day? In February? Q1. In Q1. I assume that's yeah. yeah, so that is... Um, all electricity um, participants, um, it's an MHHS focus, anyone and everyone that needs to do anything or needs to be aware of it, um, it's it's open to, to everyone, um, ideally face to face, um, but it, and the plan is to, to have it online as well. The programme led or record? That's a, the record project. Record yeah. 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 Obviously we'll all pitch in on that one. So. Fantastic. Then I think we'll welcome Daniel up and Daniel's going to give a qualification specific overview. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Harriet. Uh, lovely to meet you all. In fact, I think um, I have met a lot of you in terms of on calls or exchange emails, but it's good to, good to meet you all in person. If we've not met, I'm Daniel, the REC Qualification Manager. And obviously, today I'm going to be talking through MHHS qualification with everyone. So I appreciate the, the and the last thing standing between you guys and lunch. So I'll keep my actual content quite, quite brief, but Obviously, MHHS qualification is going to have a big impact for a lot of you, both in terms of the you know, efforts and, and resourcing you're going to be putting into it. But also, if, if it's not handled effectively, it could impact your ability to be able to communicate with other market participants. So I get this is an important area. And if you have any questions you know, after I've gone through all this, 
and happy to stay as, as you know as long as needed. But yeah, in terms of what MHHS qualification is, you know, Harriet's just ran through a whole list of things that are going to be changing under the REC, both in terms of your obligations under the code, then also how you're going to be you know interacting with other market participants and, and interfacing directly with the central services. So the purpose of the MHHS qualification approach is for us to be able to get that assurance that, that you have updated your systems and processes in line with your sort of new obligations under the REC. I appreciate we have an existing system and process change exposure, which a lot of you have gone through before. Obviously, the purpose of this separate MHS uh, qualification activity is for us to be able to work with other industry participants, uh, such as you know, Alexon BSC, DIP Manager, um, all that you know, good fun stuff, and make sure we've got an effective communication, uh, effective qualification approach, which will allow us to get the assurance that we need both on, on you know, your ability to meet your obligations under REC and also for us to be able to monitor any wider, you know, retail risks that this uh, you know, process might have. So I think in terms of who has to do this, uh, so you'll be glad to know that as a gas uh, gas supplier or gas participant, you won't necessarily have to do this unless it was your fuel. Um, I think for, so, so, so for DNOs, it's a bit of a special case because DNOs aren't going to have a, you know, aren't going to have any control as to whether, you know, suppliers are registering MHS or non-MHS meets points on their networks. So DNOs do need to be qualified before the start of MHS migration. Um, but for suppliers and agents, the majority of suppliers and agents um, will be qualified in different qualification waves, so sort of just after the, the start of the migration. Although a small number of participants have volunteered for system integration testing, and they're going to be qualified, you know, around the time of the migration or, or just afterwards. So I think then actually we can deep dive a bit more into what MHS qualification is going to entail. Um, yeah, absolutely. So there are the key main activities that you're going to be completing are a pre-qualification submission, which is where parties are notifying us that, that they want to you know, operate in this post-MHS world and give us some details in terms of you know, what system architecture you're going to be operating with, what your testing implementation and plan is going to be, whether you're going to be doing it yourself or with uh, you know, placing reliance on, on some other testing. And that was completed you know, a little while ago, but obviously we, we appreciate that somewhat subject to, to change. Um, one of the sort of key first activities you'll be completing, which I imagine a lot of you do, are doing right now, is pre-integration testing, which is where you've been given a list of, of the MHS requirements and, and you've, de you've designed a sort of test cases and test approaches to be able to demonstrate that your updated systems and processes will enable you to operate in line with these MHS requirements. I appreciate a lot of the activities you've done for that are independent, but the programme and the co-bodies have provided resources around that. And we'll also be doing some assurance activities afterwards. Um, you're then going to be submitting an initial qualification assessment document. So the qualification assessment document does somewhat focus on, on the technical aspects of it in terms of, you know, what, what changes you've made and, you know, making sure that, that you're going to be sending you know, the correct new data flows and the correct order and, and things like that. But it's also focused not just on the technical side, but also the business operation side of it. So a lot of these processes, you know, for, for some, some activities, you've got, for example, a new obligation to be processing flows within 60 minutes. Well, if, if anything does go wrong with that and any manual intervention is required, you know, the, the, one of the things we'll be pulling out in the quad is specifically how you're going to be, you know, how you're going to be dealing with that and what the actual steps are you're going to take where, where manual intervention is required. That's something that we wouldn't necessarily be able to pull out as part of, for example, the qualification testing. Um, so the qualification testing will be done directly uh, using our qualification testing framework. This will be a little bit more structured than, than the PIT in that you'll be given specific test cases you have to complete and also we'll be working with you to coordinate the test data on that. Um, so the final step after you do the you know, pre-integration testing, the qualification testing, your initial quad, quad, you'll be submitting a final quad, which is going to capture all of the testing you've completed as well as all of the system and process changes you've made. Um, the REC and, and BSC code bodies as applicable will be reviewing that final quad, then hopefully uh, giving you approval that, that your MHS qualification has been complete, and we can onboard you to, to the DIP and ISD and, and things like that. So in terms of the timeframes for this, if we can please move on to the next slide. So most of you should have already completed your pre-qualification submission in April 2024. I think here I've just we're, we're just running through some indicative timeframes if you're in qualification wave one. So I appreciate that some people are going to be in slightly later qualification waves. Some of these dates might be, you know, pushed along a little bit. Um, and some of you that are completing SIR obviously will be doing a lot of these activities a lot sooner. 
Um, but for example, if you're in qualification wave one, uh, last month you submitted to us a sort of final pit approaching plan, which we're currently reviewing. And in fact, that's what I was doing in the background just before, <laughs> just before talking here. And in a few months' time, you're also going to be submitting to us uh, some of your, your sort of final uh, requirements test traceability matrix that you've been using throughout your, your pit testing. Um, the, the next main deliverable after that will be for you to submit the initial quad. And there is a bit of a window for you to submit that quad, but it should be done after you've done the pre-integration testing. Uh, after you've submitted the initial quad, we'll obviously provide feedback and, and you might be making some changes to, to your subsequent quad submission or to potentially your testing approach as well for our qualification testing. Um, for the qualification testing, the actual execution period for people in wave one will be from sort of August 2025 to January 2026. Obviously, some people will be able to progress through that a little bit quicker than others. Uh, but before that, we will be doing some entry checks as well, where you have to submit some, some you know, earlier documentation to us. Finally, after you've completed the qualification testing, like I say, you'll be, you'll be submitting your final quad. And again, it's a bit of a window for you to be submitting that in. But the earlier you submit it, obviously the earlier you'll be able to complete NHS qualification and, and begin operating. I think then we've got a few slides where we've got, you know, a bit more of the lower level detail of each of the different waves and each of the different deadlines for you to complete. Um, I think just, just based on time, we're not going to run through all, all of these numbers. But as, as Paul said, you'll be getting a copy of these slides after, uh, after the meeting. I think I just want to reiterate here the point that this is very much an iterative approach. So there we've broken it down into, oh, you'll be completing pitch, you'll be completing qualification testing. There are going to be multiple deliverables that you'll be doing throughout that and plenty of chance to get feedback from, uh, from the code bodies and from MHS program. And like I say, in terms of the waves themselves, they're usually about sort of six weeks spread apart. I think that's, I think we can probably skip ahead from also the, the sort of quad timeframes, which again, we briefly mentioned, but slightly different for slight waves. And again, you know, the, the sort of deadlines for these quad submissions for the SIT parties is a little bit sooner. Um, but yeah, I think we can move on then to new entrant requirements. So I appreciate most of you here are existing rep parties, but some of you might want to be qualifying in a new role, or you might be working with other companies who do want to qualify in a new role. So I think the main thing we want to emphasize here is that there's always going to be, you know, an approach, a path open for people to be able to complete qualification under the rec. Specifically, what that will entail will depend on when the company is planning to enter the market. So, for example, if, if you're planning to enter the market before the start of MHS migration, you'll have to complete all of the legacy rec processes, but then also complete MHS pro, um, qualification with the MHS program as well. Um, if you're wanting to enter the market between the start of migration, which is M11, M12, and sort of the point at which there's going to be no more uh, legacy registrations, which is M14, then it will very much depend on, on the sort of role that you're entering the market as. Like I say, if you're a DNO, because you don't have a choice as to what meter points are going to be registered on your services, you'll have to do both legacy and MHS qualification. Um, but if you're a supplier or agents who might just want to operate using MHS, uh, you know, processes, then you might not have to do all of the legacy um, arrangements. And if you're going to be qualifying after M14, then you know, there's going to be no MHS program, but we are currently defining an enduring approach for that, which will involve, for example, updating some of the REC um, and BSC joint storyboards that we have. And there'll also be, you know, potentially some some elements of, of um, dip, dip manager testing as well. I think then if we move on to the final slide, uh, just in terms of if you want to get some more information on this, um, we put a sort of link to some good resources. I want to call out the uh, rep wiki or NHS hub, which Harriet mentioned earlier. A great place for you to get, you know, a lot more information on these uh, MHS rec qualification requirements. Um, the qualification approach and plan, which is on the MHS website, is a great resource which has all of this information in, in a lot more detail. So I definitely recommend checking that out. And it's been updated soon as well with, um, you know, the dates that are being shifted as part of CR55. Um, the qualification assessment document itself has some guidance on you know, each of the questions, how, how you need to complete it. And as Harriet mentioned, we've got a webinar next week on the 14th of November, but we're going to be going through the level of information and level of evidence that we expect as part of, as part of those um, submissions. Um, we've also got the REC MHS assessment criteria, so that outlines for each of the different MHS requirements, uh, the level of assurance that the REC are going to be asking for, so whether you need to just answer questions in the quad 
uh, whether we need to do pit testing on it or whether we need to do SIT or QT testing on it. Um, we also have the requirements test traceability matrices, which we've um, designed with the MHS program and with the other codes as well to sort of consolidate all of that information on, OK, this is your full list of requirements and this is you know, the various test cases that this maps to. So we'd definitely recommend, recommend checking out those resources. And finally, just to pull it back as well, obviously we've been talking a lot here about MHS requirements. But in reality, these are REC code requirements. The REC code is changing. So if you've not had a chance to, to take a look through as to you know what those changes are going to look like, would definitely recommend you take a look. They're all sort of available now to be able to see you know what is changing and and when. So I think that's everything in terms of what I wanted to go through. But I imagine we're going to have a bunch of questions both in the room and also on Slido about MHS qualification. So happy to uh, happy to take those. Not on Slido yet, actually, uh, funnily enough, but make people safe for, them for the uh, the panel session after lunch as well. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> Daniel and Harry are going to have a, a room in the breakout sessions as well with the opportunity to uh, for you to come and ask your questions around MHHS specifically. But are there any questions from anyone in the room? Yes. I've got one quick one. Um, if the timeline gets pushed to September, does that move all the waves as well? Or does that mean waves? one starts at the same time as the sit. I think it'll very much depend in, in terms of the, yeah, the scale of any changes that are made. I think there is that dependency that sit is going to have to be completed before we can do the qualification testing. So it might be that if we're talking about, you know, a few days movement, it might not be that QT needs to be massively moved. But if if for whatever reason sit can't be completed within those time frames, then we would then need to move QT. And I think there are there are points too as well in, in the fact that a lot of the participants you are placing reliance on, on previous testing that has been done. So if that testing hasn't been completed yet as part of SIT, then they won't be able to complete their own qualification anyway. So I think, you know, any any sort of questions like that, hopefully I'm, I'm hoping that this will be the final, uh, what, what's the phrase we have to use? Recalibration of the of the uh, testing <laughs> time timetables, but we, we'll, we shall see. And, you know, we'll, we'll do what we've done previously, which is if we are going to be making any changes to the qualification timeframes, we'll be you know, discussing that as part of the qualification working group and giving you all opportunity to be able to, you know, voice your opinions um, and concerns on that as well. <coughs> Any more questions from the floor? Yep. Um, how are you sharing the kind of responsibilities of assessment between yourself and the BSC qualification service provider? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's an interesting one as well, because obviously some of those activities like reviewing the quad, both the codes are going to be doing, but we are going to be doing it with a different lens. So we're going to be focusing on making sure that you're able to meet your REC obligations and the BSC is going to be focusing on making sure you can meet your BSC obligations. Um, you know, the DIP manager or, or, you know, some entity will be, will be, you know, focused on making sure you can meet your requirements, the DIP code of connection. So I think some of these activities, although they're aligned in the sense that you have to do qualification testing, you have to do the quad as one submission, they'll be reviewed by different parties. I think, for example, the SOFI platform that you're going to be submitting your quad on, you know, both the REC code manager and BSC code manager are going to have the ability to be able to go into that and, and make comments on, on your submission. So, so this will be like a joint approach. It won't like go to you, then it'll go to KPMG. Not necessarily. It won't necessarily be sequential in that order. Yeah, we'll yeah. all be able to view it once. Yeah. And then you all need to sign it off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Happy. Exactly. And it is an independent sign off as well. So obviously we'll, we'll make sure the activities are coordinated. But just because, you know, REC has signed something off, that doesn't necessarily mean that BSC will and, and vice versa. And are you all, do you all have like... SLAs, I guess, to like turn yeah. around and review these things within a certain time frame. Absolutely. So we have that we have that um, high level SLA that, that I think is mentioned somewhere on these slides that you'll be able to see afterwards. Yeah. So the initial quad after you submit it um, will have six weeks to review it and final quad will have four weeks to review it. But obviously, you know, we'll, we'll review it as soon as we can. We're not just going to yeah. wait until the end of those six weeks. But for those those SLAs are agreed for both the REC side and the BSC side. So we're both going to be working towards the same time frames. Okay. That's right, there's a very well found, Paul. Thank you. Just a reminder, if you, we're, we welcome questions from the floor, but also if you've got questions that you want to raise on Slido, um, the QR code is on the screen. Um, please or go to slido.com and put in that code there, and you can add in your questions that way. We've only got the two questions that uh, were raised in this morning's session so far that weren't addressed. And we'll address those first and then we'll move open to the floor in case there are any further questions. We have a lovely panel, uh, people you recognise now for the most part here today. 
Uh, so, Shelley, um, as a reminder, Shelley Rouse is our lead operational account manager. Um, her team of operational account managers, you will know very well, they've been in the room with you today. Uh, they're here to help you navigate through your uh, journey as a code party. Uh, Harriet Truss um, from the RECCO manager wearing two hats uh, on the panel today. Um, as a change analyst, she's here to represent the, the wider REC change process and, and REC change team. But also, obviously, you've heard us speak from her perspective as the, the, the go-to person on MarketWide of our settlement from a, a REC impact perspective. Anton Moden, you know, is the, uh, the head of the performance assurance team within the REC code manager. Daniel Rogers here to speak around the qualification um, impact with respect to MHHS. Sarah Jones um, from RECO, who's been integral to the MHHS program from a, a rep perspective as well. And Ross Timberley from the Code Managers Technical Services team uh, with that specific um, impact or area of, of expertise of the digital navigator and market messages that she was here talking about um, earlier. I'm here as well, obviously, if there's any questions around uh, the comms within RECO or the, the, the portal, I'm more than happy to, to support with any questions that you may have. So that's us. That's who we are. Um, thank you for your questions that you've been asking throughout the morning. And I realise you may have exhausted some of them, but hopefully we're able to, to, to pull a few more out of you yet, um, because <laughs> <laughs> after this session, you'll have it. Yet more opportunities to ask questions, but on a more um, individual basis as we split out into three different rooms where we'll focus on uh, your questions around performance assurance, um, the REC portal and uh, digital services within the REC and on uh, MHHS as well. But this is your opportunity to ask those questions to the group if you do so feel comfortable uh, to do so. Amy asked two questions uh, through Slido this morning, which I think we we're able to answer now. Um, we'll start with the one at the bottom, um, and that's uh, whether we had, uh, we, uh, I think the question was actually directed at Mark Loveday, who's had to, to leave us now from RECO, but I, I think we'll take it as the co-manager um, and joining with RECO. Have we considered a joined up approach to utility theft with water, gas and heat included? I think, Anton, you might have a response for this one. Yeah, so we obviously work on theft detection and driving forward the design of our counter theft work i would say we're predominantly focused on electricity and gas and that this hasn't been included but we can certainly consider it i've worked on illegal connections and cross connections in water in the past um typically we don't see massive coincidence between water uh, electricity and gas um, and honestly i don't know what the incidence of heat theft would be but we certainly should uh, look to see if there are any specific crossovers and ask the question to the energy theft reduction expert group. Yeah, I know um, we continue to work closely with um, partner trade associations, people like the UK Revenue Protection Association as well within the, the rep co-manager. So we have relationships with, with them trade associations. They have probably slightly wider and more strategic um, yeah, views of, of those different areas. But at the moment, yeah. focus has been, I think gas has certainly been included within our- uh, definitely uh, electricity and gas. Yeah. Definitely electricity and gas. In terms of water and heat. Um, and we do, work, we do work with a business that used to be called Smart Water, although they're not about drinking water, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you very much. I uh, hope that answers that question, Ailey. Um, the second question from Ailey, where the code was unclear, feedback on how the code is written as part of code reform considered a rewrite in plain language, plain English. Uh, would we consider it? So I suppose the question is, how are we ensuring that the code documents are, are written in plain English in a way that code reform is driving towards? Harriet, you're here from a change team point of view. Do you want to speak around how the change team sort of uh, work to ensure that the code does meet those requirements? Um, yeah, so I think um, it's important to note, so when the the REC has been drafted and come together, it was kind of a recurse of the word for the, for the code form, the um, information that's been talked about there, and that the intention has always been that it's plain, plain English um, in, the, um, in the code. Um, obviously, it, from a change perspective, and make it, it is legal text, it does have to um, kind of stand up from a legal perspective, so to a certain extent that can in influence the, the plain English element of that. But absolutely, kind of main principle is that it, it should already be in plain English. Some bits did get pulled across um, from previous codes and, and haven't been um, as 
and thoroughly kind of looked at in that perspective. However, I think the key message really is if there is anything that um, people identify that isn't working, and we have had instances in the past where it's need clarification, things like that, raise it with us and we can, we can look to improve it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it should be from a rep perspective um, in a good place already. Anton, you spoke earlier around the fact that a lot of your focus is on finding out where the code isn't clear enough that it, it, it doesn't allow parties to consistently meet obligations in the way we expect them to. So I suppose where things aren't written plainly enough, that's part of what you're able to assess as well and find data that suggests. It definitely, it definitely is. And in, in certain circumstances, we have issued guidance because we thought that it's reasonable people would get confused by the code. And there are two really clear examples of that. Um, anonymous and withdrawals, which was ambiguous. So, um, you know, we then changed it so it was definitive, um, but also to do with switch meter reads. So I think the code is part of it, but the suite of guidance around it is also part of it. Um, I, I think the thing to say, we're doing our best here, but we'll never identify it and we'll never all of it and we'll never see it in the same way you see it, right? So if you find something that just either doesn't make sense or isn't clear or requires quite a PhD in that topic to try and decipher. So it might be accurate, but it's, it's too complicated. I, I think raise it, raise it. OEM's always happy to hear this. If you're working on a change, people will always be happy to talk about readability. We all did plain English training at the start of the wreck as well. So we, we drilled into our head, try, trying to make things simple whenever we can, trying to make things fit for the audience. We also, where there is a particularly complex subject matter, we do try to demystify with the use of the rep wiki as well. If you ever think there's a subject matter here that is really complex, I, I'd like an easier way to understand it, talk to us and we, we can see whether we can generate some sort of a, a wiki article to, to simplify that even further. The other thing I would point people to is some people love a good bit of text, other people are visual. I'm definitely a visual person and anybody who's worked with me will know that I'm constantly drawing PowerPoints to try to explain what I mean. We have a version of that in the REC, which are process maps. They're really powerful. They're on the REC portal. I'm not saying they're the simplest things in the world, but some people take information in that way better. So do refer to the process maps. We also found um, actually as part of the UX UI project that I think people had kind of didn't know they were there. They, they were artifacts that came over as part of the, the, the creation of the wreck, but people thought they didn't exist anymore because where they, where they were stored or they weren't as immediately available. So bringing those to the forefront within the mega menu to make them more accessible again is, is brought them back to, mm -hmm. to visibility. They do exist. They are powerful tools and Ross's team sort of look after those, I think, don't you, as part of the... You run into the change process. Also, through the UX rebranding, so they weren't called market scenario. That might be what you're picturing in your mind, but now we've rebranded them to process maps, so it's much more obvious to people when they see that term. Um, yeah, I think the other thing to call out on those is um, obviously they are going to be impacted by MHHS and they are being updated for that as well. So there'll be versions of those, and we'll, although they won't necessarily be live as such um, until until later, we will make them available so when they're ready, really. And we are reviewing the tool they're built on to get to one that gives us a lot more scope in how they're designed. So if you did have feedback on those process maps and how we can make them even more useful for you, that'd be very well, welcome because that can feed into that wider work we're doing there. Thank you. A very multifaceted uh, response to your answer there, I think, Ailey, but hopefully that covered the core of your question. <coughs> we don't have any more questions on the slide at the moment, so plenty of opportunity for those on the phone to ask questions, so please do. Uh, are there any questions that anyone had in the room for our panel today? Mark? One thing I'd like to add on, on Clen, um, tidying up however the rec's worded. One of the things I hated under the documents under BSC, and a lot of, especially the BSCPs, yeah. is some documents would have 150 footnotes. Okay, dotted everywhere. And in some cases, they were minor, minor things that they told you. Yeah. In other cases, those footnotes were actually key to the process. Now, my personal view is scrap them all. There shouldn't be footnotes. Um, the worst thing was, in some cases, with the documents, the footnote could be 10 pages ahead, further down, could be 10 pages the other way. At one point, they tried to put them all at the end, but they found Microsoft didn't work very well doing that. But I think if you, I don't know if there are any, so I'm not saying you're guilty of it, but I think footnotes are something that should be absolutely avoided unless absolutely essential. And I don't think there should be, there should ever be an instance where you need one. 
I think that's really clear, right? How can we? <laughs> that's a really clear argument, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've, we've done. We've recently we've had a change on the meter operation schedule, and we've lifted all the footnotes up yeah. in the meter operation schedule. And yeah, going forward, is that that general principle? If we're drafting anything new, making amendments, um, we wouldn't put anything in footnotes. Yeah, and if what I would say, and I tried to get Alexon to do it, was if you're if you're changing or updating a document, while you do it, get rid of the footnotes that are there, even if it's not part of the purpose of the change by removing the footnotes as a housekeeping, if you like. Um, I think everybody finds that a lot easier to read, not just me. I think anybody else who picks the document up <laughs> because you read it. Some people might miss the little number two against the something yeah. and they miss something vital. I, th I think we could take that away and give you the yeah. Yeah, I think we have it as a, yeah, we have it as a kind of thing in mind that yeah. there's, there's probably more work to do. Obviously, the meter operation schedule is quite well hit by the MHHS um, changes. So that's why that one kind of <coughs> um, more immediately. But it's it's definitely something that they are there through the code. Um, and pick things off, pick schedules off as we go. Just as much as readability issues, it causes administration issues as well. It's not it's not easy to to keep a document updated when you've got footnotes throughout. It's, not, it's a good thing for us. Yes. On those footnotes, what you know the like the RGMA documentation for data flows. When they moved over to REC, all of those were taken off as part of that. But also the flows, they were very critical because it de determined the type of data items that needed to be required. So in this scenario, you had to also populate this. Or in this scenario, you wouldn't. It would say that, but all that's now gone um, in regards to data items. And I have challenges all the time when having conversations with other parties saying, yes, that's, I know it's not there, but in this scenario, you must have this. For an example, if we're getting appointed for the first time, we need a minimum requirement of a postcode under the address details. But on the, I think on the documentation that says it's an optional, but it doesn't say. <laughs> yes. Can I pick up with that and then see if I can get a bit more information for oh, you? We can look at filling that gap. Yeah. That it sounds like this happened when those flows moved into meeting operations. And yes, there's quite a lot of them that are like that that I've noticed. Yeah, we'll catch up with you after that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any more questions from the room? Yes, please, Colin. Uh, it's probably another one for Anton, but um, what challenges do you see um, with performance assurance reporting um, with data? Because I think I'm probably speaking for more than just us, um, but that sometimes it can be very hard to replicate the data in performance assurance reporting from your own data. Yeah. And, okay. and, and it's sort of quite difficult to know what data sources wreck are mining for the performance assurance reporting. Yeah. As opposed to what we're probably mining to do our own internal reporting. I just wonder if you had any reflections on that. I have a good reflection on this. We talked about tensions and trying to find the right balance. This is a classic one, right? So it says in the code, and I agree with this general principle, that we should take central sources. We're thinking about that for two reasons, right? The first is it's just more efficient instead of, you know, count the number of suppliers, count the number of DNOs, sending us different information. That That is an inefficient model versus getting it centrally. Secondly, like, we know it's all being done in the same way. One of the things we've got, we got one at the moment where we're trying to work out if we should get Detailed data, but we can send us average times things take. Well, we realise if we do <laughs> average times things take, people do it all differently. So we want the detailed data. We'll do the calculation once consistently. Um, I think what you're talking about is a strong reason why we should work with company provided information. You can instantly dial it back. You probably see it at the same time as you send it to us. Um, however, that. There are those countervailing arguments. It's probably costs things. We can tell you where we get the information. A lot of our information comes from the CSS. And sometimes there's kind of a bit like accounting. There's a cruel basis that you, you might count things differently in terms of whether you're counting in that month, whether the switch was raised or the switch was completed or got to secure active or, or whatever it is. That's normally the case. It is a bit. It isn't a great use of time. You guys try to reconcile these data sources. I, I guess it's all about that balance. 
overall, we're looking for central data because it saves you time. We're happy to tell you what our data are, but the trade-off is, is when investigating, you will need to compare yours and align them. If, if we want that greater reliability and consistency of your information versus ours, you need, you need to provide it that. It's a trade-off. Well, what's the reality? The reality is they're both valid approaches, so we'll have, end up having leaks in future. It's about picking the right, the right ones. I will generally push towards centrally provided data on the efficiency point and on the reliability. You know, there, there might be a time where a contract manager goes off sick and they don't submit something, somebody needs to chase them. All of that is work that kind of doesn't, it needs to happen, it doesn't add, add value. So that is the, the key one, but we do need to recognise that trade-off between reconciliation. <laughs> Typically do work on canonical sources, though. If we're using CSS for um, reporting on switching, we might have the same crawl basis as you. But that, that, those are real things, right? They are real erroneous, which is real objections, or whatever the, the case may be. But we don't tend to take proxies in any in any, yeah. any case. I think one area, where, I mean, one good example, I think, of where it's difficult is uh, with what's... Um, Coming in around change of tenancy for us to try, you know, the change of tenancy performance assurance reporting is challenging because, yes, you've got a COT indicator, but is it applied universally throughout the throughout market participants? No, it isn't. So it's it it then becomes difficult. Although it's a central source, it's not particularly is it as reliable as it could be. I, mean, I, I think you're exactly right. In preparing for today, my most feared topic was the change of tenancy. <laughs> well, I knew it was going to start that, but it's not. So the, the change of tenancy is challenging. The assurance must match the code solution. It is not reasonable for things not to be in, that are not in the code, but to be the things you're measuring. Now, clearly, there are some times where proxies are okay, right? And that's the closest you can ever get. But the performance assurance team do not select what the obligations are. That process is involves correlating multiple switches where the customer journey jumps in and out of CSS across places and involves things that only the supplier sees. I personally think that there are arguments for the approach taken and we consulted the PAB and they gave us a strong steer to do continuous monitoring. Um, we have heard from the party impact <coughs> assessment I wouldn't be surprised if we hear again on consultation feedback from the industry that this is not the right approach. We will consider that. We will consider that. I think there are three generic options and each of them can be kind of configured. The first option is that we assess people before it happens. We say, where's your policy? Where's your process? How are you updating the system? The second option is we monitor it continuously. That's normally the one we prefer where good quality data exists that you don't have to give us because it's least impact on you and therefore the cost benefit case is the best. And we can come at, obviously it needs to kind of be haphazard and random, haphazard in a good way. Um, we, need, we can come and talk to people about their individual COPs and say like, okay, you had a COP, can you show me that happened in the timetable? Can you show me that it happened with the relevant evidence and that there was some reasonableness here? Those are our three generic solutions. You can tweak each one of them, mm. but I, I think there has to be a balance there. Striking that balance is hard. And the steer that we got from the PAB was to do those first two, pre-test and continuous monitoring. You know, I'm, 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 I'm happy to talk to the PAB about it again. I think there has been <coughs> a clear statement from suppliers that they're really the only affected parties here um, to, to do that. I'm happy to do that. We obviously need to work that through with the change process. But you're right, we rely on information that's not consistently populated. We therefore have a question. How do we identify bots if we're not going to use the central data? If that's not reliable, we then might need to assure that. This all gets very complicated. We need to avoid that complication and do something that kind of works and makes sense. There we go. You triggered a bit of a soapbox moment. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Any more questions from the room? Yes. Just on that note about the access of data, I'm guessing the difficulty is as well the methods of communication that all individual parties can do. Because you've got email, yes, you were talking ETN about gateways, IX gateway, and the 
all the data items can be sent through. I believe there's a, a change <coughs> or potential change to look at migrating them all into one form of communication. So the reality is that the REC does not control all of the systems that intermediate this. We had, a, I think you were in the workshop, James was in the workshop, it was a while ago, that generated four changes. I think the longer term solution has to be a mandated method. I don't know if that's the DIP. I don't know if that's changes into the UK link. I don't know if that's an intermediated system that the REC controls. That will be the only way that this data gets into a good quality efficiently. That is probably not something that we can ask directly from the change process. It is a big cost for the industry, and these things have to happen considering the other huge things that are going on, right? We can't spin up our own MHHS whilst MHHS is going on, sucking up all of the energy of the industry. Um, I will tell you what I think will happen. I don't know. There's quite a lot of decision making needed there, but the change is going to be. Actually, I think it was inspired by partly discussions with your organisation and how you deal with the challenge. But it needs to be visible what flows you will accept. And it's not acceptable to not take a flow. It needs to be visible. So maybe you as a business don't accept anything over email or don't have a DTN connection. That's OK, as long as people can find out how to message you in the right way and that, that communication is accepted. That feels like a change that could happen. And I think it's I0196. Anyway, it's one of the numbers. One of the numbers. But in the longer term, that consistency will only happen with system change. There might be something on the dip. There might be things under other codes driving UK link better and more consistent. They will take time. Thank you. That's all. Any more questions? Yes, June. You mentioned earlier on that there'd been an uptick in engagement in terms of consultation responses. Yes. So those response of uh, the changes that are authority determined, what sort of level of feedback does the regulator see? Is it all feedback that's come through consultations or just the change report or is it some kind of in between? Yeah, so the change reports within the change report have linked to the um to the consolidated responses the consolidated responses have all the all the questions and responses in there um sometimes some are conf confidential so as kind of interesting members you might not see them all when we send those out whether it's a um an appeal or whether it's authority led anyway those mm -hmm. um get sent over and they get the full confidential versions um of that consolidated response document so all of it, basically, put simply. Um, yeah. Which responses as they are, we'll just sort of yeah. So we're keeping that consolidated one together. It's it's literally just a copy and paste, drop exactly what's on your individual responses. Okay. Um, so we don't adjust anything. It might format it like slightly, but it literally a lift and drop. So it's all in one document. So everything goes. Thanks. As Harry mentioned, though, it's not, of course, these days typical that most changes are authority led changes where the where often would have a uh, uh, position that they put forward an ultimate decision most changes now apart from those really significant impacting ones fall under the self-governance controls so often we'd only likely see those responses as part of an appeal pack um, and i think we've only had one or maybe two appeals under the record so yeah far, so, so unless it's one where we've said it's actually yeah it needs to go yeah. up to them but then in terms of the decision making so whether it's change panel or one of the expert panels they get the same thing. They yeah. get the full document. They would get the confidential versions as well. Um, and obviously then what's public is a slightly strip back those. Thank you, June. Was the talk? Yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it's another performance assurance one. <clears throat> now, the comment earlier was about the fact that performance assurance is driven from rec obligations. Yeah. One of the um, items under Sprint 3, which hasn't started yet, is meter location for electricity. Yeah. Okay. I believe it's to do with where you're looking, where the meter location is unknown. Unknown is a valid meter location within electricity. Yeah. So where where is the virus to do anything with those? Because there is no obligation for anybody to actually maintain that. In <laughs> There is in gas, because what gas says and said some time ago is, if you go on site and do work, you must update the meter location once you finish the work from unknown to something. 
Electricity doesn't have that. So I'm not sure what we're driving at people to do anything. Mark, when, when you came in the room, value, there'd be a question I wouldn't be able to answer, unfortunately. <laughs> what I'll do is I'll connect you with my colleague, Andrew Waghorn, who like, is the, the guy that leads this and helps the decisions. Pab, are involved with the decisions on, on what, what should be cleansed. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer. If I did, I'd tell you, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, but um, I'll connect him so you can have that public discussion. I'm just, just curious because obviously it, it goes to the ethos of you know what the, the sprints are about. Um, I understand that having an unknown is not good, and I suspect it's bad practice by the meter workers of not updating it. But unfortunately, there's nothing to go and effectively beat a mem up with because there's nothing in code that says you should update it. Um, so it's a bit of a chicken and egg, but it sounds like you're right, Mark. It sounds like you're right. <laughs> I don't know with the phone. Yeah. And um, we shouldn't be up those poor memes. Sorry, who was the gentleman's name that you said? Uh, Andrew, Andrew Wackham. I'm happy to have a good chat and connect you guys with them. Is that, if that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Mark knows him, I think. And I think I've dealt with him. Yeah. <laughs> I've dealt with most people. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'll be really clear, right? <coughs> I think it was the last sprint. Where we talked about trying to get a goal that involved cleansing data that would benefit MHHS via the rec. You provided valid feedback on a better way of doing it. We did that, right? We do listen to these things. I might not know the answer now, but we'll definitely commit to engaging with you and work with the data. Thank you, Anton. Any further questions? All right. If last chance on the uh, on the on the slide on the slide for those on the live stream to add their questions. Yeah, Colin, please. Uh, um, maybe this one from Ross. Just on the data flow catalogs, the, there's still data flow catalogs on the Electrolink <laughs> website as well. And I was just wondering at what's the, it's one of these sets of definitive or are they doing slightly different things? Maybe they, you could kind of advise on that. So we, we maintain a, a central <clears throat> SQL register that has all the market messages and data items. We then currently still manually creating an access database that contains just the DTN flow and we send that over to Electrolink and they use that to update the DTN right. and my belief is they're also using it to maintain their website too so they should match yeah. um, but if you go to the rec side you know it's coming from that central SQL database um, yeah. there was a period where the Electrolink wasn't matching um, so there is some latency sometimes and when it's updated yeah. Um, but yeah, it's all coming from the same. So the rec would be the core, the yeah. core source. And um, can you can you search those using the old references as well as the? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Legacy yeah. references are still there. They'll <laughs> they'll never be removed because they are they're in the headers for the flows as right. well. They are needed. Um, yeah. yeah. That was a very very much vocalised uh, requirement <laughs> when when it was put together at the start, wasn't it? Right. Please keep the old references. Yes. Got another one. Um, it's kind of like a question about Rex's role in three kind of future related <laughs> things, I guess. So you might not be able to answer now, but uh, regulating TPIs, customer consent solution, and flexibility as well. So I can talk a little bit to all of those, but I basically want to make sure that people have the space. So all of these, there are, there is work ongoing, but they are not concluded. I think is the, the answer. I think that's the simple answer. And that most of these are driven by Reco and not Code Manager. And following the updates that they give is the, is the normal resource. I think RV TPIs, are you probably best for flexibility. I do flexibility a bit as well. I can do consumer consent. And, can you do, and we both do, and we, several of us do consumer consent. So <laughs> we'll work that out. For TPIs, there is a proposed change that would involve TPIs kind of coming into being accredited organizations. The closest analog is that is the kind of meter installer type accredited organizations. So they'd have to pass a test, as it were. And if there's things mm -hmm. that come to light that they should be their accreditation removed, that would happen. Um, this will be an authority determined change. And we're not quite sure how that will plan out. There's a possibility that it might come under rec governance, and there's a possibility that. Other like parts of government or the regulator will decide to go a different way. So we're working on it. We'll have a detailed proposal, but we don't really know what the decision is. 
yeah. as the voluntary TPI code of practice yeah. at the moment isn't there. That's right. Yeah. And just moving to mandatory and so that moving to mandatory will be the proposal. an authority determined change. Okay. It is there at the moment and there's a number of TPIs who have signed up, but yeah. the, the change to the rec around the mandatory will mean that suppliers are only able to deal Work with the credit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a parallel uh, DESNES consultation out at the moment also on on uh, TPI code of practice. Um, there's been plenty of conversations on LinkedIn recently with people in the industry around what, what, what does this mean? What, what, what's going on? Do you have a view on 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 how that overlap might be manifesting itself and whether is there, there seems to be some confusion about what, what takes precedent, the designated consultation or the direct change? Depends if it results in license or not. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a in... there seems to be a view that it's likely that <clears throat> I think Desnes wants to well the idea the ideal from government will be that the the codes uh, develop sufficiently in a way that they can sort of build their legislation off the back of the the, the code obligations. Yeah, I, I guess the key controllers that the authority will determine, and they will not let duplicate things take place. Like you know, I obviously can't speak for Ofgem, but they won't. Like that's why it's an authority determined change, not something we inform them of. That's essential, right? That the, all the puzzle pieces fit together. The answer, the answer isn't isn't defined yet, and the change process will provide the right concept of time. I'm sorry, I wish I could tell you the answer, but that's the truth. Are we okay to move on to consent? Oh, sorry, uh, Lorna is actually one of our SMEs. She's just got a hand up, so she's actually online. So I'm hoping. Lorna. Hi everyone. Hello. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to flag that. Um, the change that Anton's talking about is an R137. It's currently out for consultation. It's closing on Friday. So you have the opportunity to comment on it just now. It, as, as has been said, it is going to complete. It will go to the authority and then it will be for off Jim and Desnes to decide what they want to do. But the rec change process will be completing. I think I'm right in saying that the impact assessment for that one was a, a popular one in terms of the number of responses we received as well. So we're expecting mm. the consultation. Yeah, we had over 100 pages of comments on that, and that will be going in its entirety to the authorities part of the change pack. Um, I should also say, go back to the question that was asked earlier about um, Ofgem Stroke Authority being aware. For 137 and 155, the, we've made sure Ofgem have all comments all the way through the process. We're not leaving that right to the end. So they have everything up to date as of now. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you. So, um, I'll try. <laughs> Fill the gaps. So, consumer consent. With, there is an open data consumer consent project that will deliver in phases. The concept here is that there is some complexity in how <clears throat> organisations access data under the REC, and some of it is pretty good. Others might need some development. So, we're not looking at changing how, say, a supplier accesses information on the inquiry services. We're not trying to revolutionise that. We acknowledge that this data will have different uses and probably some uses we can't work out at the moment as the industry develops. And therefore, there needs to be open data where that's practical and appropriate security restrictions and privacy controls where that is appropriate as well. Some of this information is, is personal and needs to be respected. RECO have established a working a project that's working on this, and there is a change, I think it's RO148, um, that establishes, if it is successful, a method of classifying data into different buckets. I think there's four. This is a test for me. So one is open, which is easy to understand, and that essentially anyone would be allowed to access that data for any pur purpose. One is conditionally open. Some of those conditions might be you're a supplier. It would be a bit cleverer than that, but do you know what I mean? Like, that's why you need it. That's fine. Uh, personal and with consent. I think that's right. My, my voice is getting higher because I'm not sure. But those are the ideas. All data items would be classified as such, and there would be a different mechanism for accessing this. Perhaps in future, open data would be more genuinely open without some kind of qualification process. So you're talking about rec data. This is uh, rec data, rec control. I was sort of referring to Ofgem's consultation on a kind of common customer consent solution where they proposed rec mm -hmm. 
being the kind of delivery body for. So once we've got this, yeah. there would then be, there needs to be a <laughs> mechanism under the REC for this to track consent and make sure that things that consumer consent needs to take place. That will be a second thing. Okay, and the classification is hard, but easier to manage a consent tokenized system. That probably will require code development. It will require system development, and it will, I, I think, be something that industry needs to come along the journey with an input onto. I think often we'll make a decision as to who should host the central content consenting platform, um, and then record feed into that with the open data piece potentially. So, but yeah, that consultation closed a couple yeah. of weeks ago, so yeah. probably a while before that decision comes out. And then flexibility, there's quite a few things, but the one I know about is the smart secure energy system. Is that the one you're thinking about? Well, just thinking, you know, beyond MHHS, you know, encouraging consumers to be more flexible with their use is kind of the next thing after MHHS. And I guess I'm interested in what REC's role is from a kind of consumer experience perspective is around that and whether you see REC having a role. In well, it. I'll give you my opinions, but they're not necessarily everybody's <laughs> opinion. Yeah. Um, firstly, I'll tell you stuff that's a bit more grounded. This will be driven by government. The government definitely see REC as a central place for data, for control, consistency and, and, and access. So we do expect, although it's subject to consultation, so who knows how these things pan out, that <coughs> REC will have a role in providing to different parties tariff data. The idea here is you could have a load controller or something like that who would access different tariffs and use that to perhaps control some of your devices. You'd obviously need consent, contracting, all of that. Yeah. You know, you can imagine a world where you're switching on and off your dishwasher or something based on based on time of use. I think that tariff database inevitably will have flexibility use cases we can't yet envisage. And it might have other regulatory use cases, but that I think is something that RECO are working on, standing up, thinking about that. That will mean we have greater proliferation of types of people. So there'll be more different people in this room in yeah. five years' time. Yeah. Perhaps load controllers are one. Yeah. Load controllers are quite different to the types of organizations we work with today. They're probably more tech businesses than people who are established in the energy industry for 30 years. Um, there might be other types of organisations that would be accessing that information as well. Clearly, the REC would have a responsibility over the provision of that service, and if it's uptime, quality of service, things like that. Probably have some responsibilities about the protection of that data and the behaviours of load controllers and the interactions around that system. Yeah, because the behaviours of them could impact other parties probably quite significantly if it's not. And a monitor properly. So it certainly could, and it certainly could impact consumers. Yes. Yeah. And none of this works if people don't trust it. Yeah. Good to hear you say that. <laughs> I would say that my job is about, but um, I think that's important. Have we covered all of the bits? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Any further questions in the room? Jim. It's another one about performance assurance. You're earning your money, actually. <laughs> Are you still looking to review the questions that consumers get asked as part of the post smart installation survey? It's called SmyCop surveys. Yes. Yeah, because I don't think they've been reviewed since SmyCop days, have they? So if there's a work group, it will be on this. So I think I've shared my. It's all about my opinions today, but my opinion in the past that there are problems with the survey. But we also should consider that it probably is a point in time thing, the survey. The smart meter rollout has gone on a while and will continue to go on, won't it? But like it, it has to slow down eventually. And the SMICOP survey or the Smith survey kind of make, only makes sense in that instance. Um, it does tell us something that also is about lifting the code up a level. Um, it tells us something about consumer outcomes, but it tells us some pretty weird things about consumer outcomes. Exactly, which is why I'm not sure they're still fit for purpose. There's probably an opportunity there, isn't there? So there is an opportunity. And the way that we've, we've, we've raised an, an issue that we want to engage people on, the voice of the consumer, the minimum I think should happen out of that is that the Smith should change so it makes sense. 
that is not necessarily the maximum. It might be that we take this same pattern and apply it to other areas and look at consumer outcomes. We have to be quite thoughtful here. We can't do too many just because, you know, we have to, let's, let's only do the most important things. But if you were to choose, would the things in SMIS be the most important things? Probably not. We need to make sure that Desnes are happy because it was their survey, right? They need to be on board with this. They are currently doing some review work on that journey, so they might be interested in certain points. Um, yeah, and I, I think we should be thinking about how it tells us things and we can move a bit away from the minutiae, think about what's working for consumers. And as I said, celebrating it and leaving it alone. You guys have got a lot of change on. And what's not working with consumers and working with industry to try and address that. I think it could be a really useful thing. I must admit, this is probably one of the most complicated changes, not in terms of the detail, but in terms of getting it right and getting the right obligations for different market participants. Perhaps there's a big role for RECO, perhaps not. Um, so I'd really, I'd really like you guys to, if you can, get involved in that working group, have your voice heard, tell us what you think might work, tell us what you think didn't work. And as Lorna says, working group is in place of voice to consumer on the 20th of November, and we encourage everyone to sign, how does one sign up to join that working group? Get an email? Email into a change. Yeah, email into the change. Email into was, change. It was in the last change bulletin. And it's, yeah, it's the usual sign up process. That's, that's for both across domestic and non domestic. Is it that working yeah. group? Yeah. We think about signing up. So we would be thinking yeah. across the whole code, actually, and ask that question of where should it focus first? Thank you. Yeah.